to order the April 10th board meeting. Can I get an approval of agenda? I move we approve the agenda for the April 10th, 2024 board meeting. A second. Jones? Yes. Byers? Yes. Kimball? Yes. Cadu Blackwood? Yes. Costello? Yes. Franklin? Yes. Gordon Ross? Yes. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you. Uh, the board welcomes and thanks Kylie Luckett for filling in for Elise this evening. And uh, we are now going to move into special recognition. And we will invite New York Elementary Showcase with Principal Halstead here to start the evening off. All right, thank you very much. I just want to say in advance, um, the reschedule really messed up my recognition. So we had lots of people that couldn't be here, but we're still going to recognize them. So thank you for having us. My name is Sunny Halstead. Um, I am the principal at New York. Um, when I was asked to showcase New York, I thought about all the wonderful things that are happening, that our staff and our students are doing. But we would be here all night, and I'm sure nobody wants to do that. So I went around and asked my student leaders in um, the building and what kind of things they thought I should share tonight. The overwhelming theme came through that it's the support that we have with our business partners and our community members. So these are groups and individuals that are making an impact and difference every day for our students and staff. So I want to mention some of them, and then I want to talk a little bit more about our amazing buddy book buddy program. So first, I'd like to recognize our Breakfast Optimist Club. This is a club that does amazing things for our school. They supply our food pantry, provide volunteers at our events, and host all of our school picnics at the end of the year, and the list goes on and on. Connect Church is another partnership that is longstanding at New York. They spoil us so much. We know they are good for treats for events and staff whenever requested. They also provide many volunteers for any event that we have at New York. ELNA, or East Lawrence Neighborhood Association, is another partnership that supports us in any way that they can, from including information in their newsletters, providing chili and desserts for our annual chili feed, to volunteering at all of our events. The Master Gardeners of Douglas County work with our Garden Club weekly. David Payton sponsors our chess club and provides individual lessons to students. Mass Street Collective brings KU athletes into our school and reads to students and has provided books for each student. And they're coming back next week, Dr. Lewis. Um, KU Science Department provides engaging science lessons to our third graders. Um, this year, with our Character Strong Assemblies, we've invited guest speakers. And some of those were Andrea Schaefer from um, Just Foods, uh, Caleb Morris, a site council chair, Caleb Locke, LHS cheer coach and his cheer squad, SRO Affalter, Free State High School basketball coach Summer Franz and her players, and we have more to come. The year's not over. So I could continue to talk. I have lots and lots of examples. We have so much support, but I really want to talk a little bit more about our Book Buddy program. So I researched this. It was in place before I came to New York. We reached out to um, principal before me, Mrs. DeGarmo. She said it was in place before she got there. Um, so what we found out is that it was started at East Heights. And when that school closed in about 2004, I believe, um, the students came over and the program came with it. So we're here two decades later continuing this amazing program. Obviously, we had a little pause during the pandemic when we didn't have volunteers. But we are back in business, so we're really excited about it. Um, here's what happens. We get volunteers, and they come in during the lunch hour. And they are partnered with a student, and the student about weekly will eat their lunch while the volunteer reads aloud to the student. And it is so, so popular. The kids love it. Um, some days they ask every day, where's my buddy? And we say, he comes on Tuesday. Today is Thursday. Um, and then students who haven't been partnered with anyone yet ask, when am I going to get a buddy? So our volunteers come from the community. We welcome anyone. Um, anyone out there looking for a volunteer opportunity, it's pretty low risk and pretty high reward. So consider that. Um, this year we even have parents and grandparents of students, but they read to other students in the school. So it's just really, really a wonderful, wonderful program. Um, so I brought some volunteers and their buddies were supposed to come, but there was a BGC basketball tournament at New York, so that could have a little impact. Um, so I would like to recognize, 
um, volunteer Ken, his buddy is Bodie, and um, then Linda Kucha is our parent involvement facilitator. And I want to recognize her, um, also my um, administrative assistant, Jory Krenzel. They are the brain behind this. They do all of the work. They find the volunteers. They check them in. They buddy them up. Um, and they don't only do that for this program, but every volunteer opportunity, every donation, cookies, they organize everything. Um, so they are amazing partnership. Um, they work so well together, and I definitely couldn't do it all by myself. So even though we just have a couple people representing, is an amazing program. We're really, really proud of it, and kids get so much out of it. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you to all the volunteers at New York Elementary for all the work that you're doing in supporting students. And we'll now um, ask Boys and Girls Club of Lawrence Youth of the Year to come up. Um, I'm really excited about this. So, Dr. Lewis. Oh, Chris. Is, is Chris Jones here? I don't think so. No? no? Okay. Wait. Do you want to come? Yeah. Um, hello, my name is Leron Williams. I go to Free State High School and I am a senior. I apologize for the casual wear, just came from club. <laughs> I'm going to be giving my speech before accepting any questions our board members might have. I'm almost done. The high school senior in me wondering why my late game is so simplistic. Welcome to the big leagues, they say while patting me on my back as I walk by. And no, these aren't real people. It's just that same mental image that plagues my mind every time I think about adulthood. Besides, I can't really call myself a club kid anymore. My youth mostly ran away with my innocence. But I have been molded bit by bit into someone that I can embrace, truly thanks to my club. It's no stretch to directly assert any of this either. It's the truth evident to my family and my peers. You can call it modesty, but I refer to it as self-awareness. Because after all, I personally didn't get this far as though I can do it all on my own. And so today, I can express the extent of my gratitude that I have as a 17-year-old who joined my club family at 13. The truth and only the truth will be told from this point on, out of respect for you all. A choice, my choice, define those moments I spoke of. Everything I've endured up to this very point. The True Boys and Girls Club experience isn't a casual walk in and out nor is it even close to being a one and done. In fact, the internship opportunity that club offered me was definitely a necessary push towards that adult direction I envisioned. My internship happened last summer, so as one might have guessed, I had to pick between the reality of joining the workforce and the carefree innocence that came along with summer break. This conveniently led to me becoming a productive, caring, and responsible citizen, surrounded by more than just respect, and smaller with genuine affection. It's always much more than self-serve community building. My work experience shared a commonality with all the youth I served, open arms. Now becoming a very mature, when I want to be, young man whose <laughs> compatibility is unmatched earned me favor by default. I ended up losing during last year's local competition, yet still, here I am, giving another speech and thanks to the consistent empowerment from the Boys and Girls Club. However, being here today amounts to my warm, welcoming goodbye. Going towards the door of transition without a few words felt inappropriate because I was taught to stand out and stand proud. As much as I wanted to include quite literally everything from my essays into this one speech, I guess we were just supposed to mean it in a different way. I'm not going to turn this into a praise session, but I will say thank you. I am here because of you, and I am tenacious because of you and I am Leron because of you. I'm a new me, a beginning after end. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jacory Taylor. I'm from New York Elementary School.
BGC is special to me for many reasons. I get to see my friends and have a good time and do things for the community that I love, like making an art self-supply with Spark. I appreciate the opportunity to play summer flag football with four other friends that help bring our team to the final two teams. We only have five players total, but we are still able to make it to the championship game. We were exhausted, but BGC staff and coaches pushed us to keep going. Another another story that makes BGC great was when I was at I was at Kennedy. I was running to the Kennedy door. I pushed the door open. The only thing I can remember was seeing Miss Taylor and Miss Elise running down the hallway to see what happened. That just shows how much staff care about me. While BGC has helped me during these last five and a half years, my family has been there from, for me from day one. My mom, my dad, and my brother. Oh, and don't forget my two dogs that has played a big role as well. <laughs> my mom and my dad are there for me when I need them in hard, situa in hard situations. My brother is there for me when I need him. He did youth through the year, so that's why I wanted to do junior youth through the year. With that being said, thank you, family and BGC staff, for everything you've done for me. Again, my name is Ja'Cory Taylor. See you later. to say thank you again to Jacory and Laurent for coming in here today to give their speeches. Um, Laurent was the winner of the Lawrence Youth of the Year for 2024, and he went on to um, compete in the Kansas Youth of the Year just last month, and he was the runner-up in that one. So again, congratulations, Laurent. You did amazing. <laughs> And then Ja'Cory here, his little brother, he was the winner of the Lawrence Junior Youth of the Year. So, and again, congratulations, Ja'Cory. <laughs> Fun to be along on this journey with you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. New York W25 to 8, New York Nation. Yeah. <laughs> hold on, hold on, come back, come back. Okay. I think board members have questions. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what this experience has meant for you and how you think it'll help you when you go on to your next step. You mentioned that you're looking at moving on past mm -hmm. Lawrence Public Schools and Boys mm -hmm. and Girls Club. Yeah, so um, I'm not originally from Kansas. I was born in Minnesota, lived in Virginia for a while, and then I did come to Kansas eventually with my mom. She introduced me to Boys and Girls Club, actually, when I was in Central Middle School. At first, I was very reluctant. I <laughs> doubted everything she said and how, how, like, the, like, sheer amount of options they had. I wasn't sure. But, like, after trying it for myself and, like, seeing how much the staff member cared with, like, the variety of different options they offered for the um, uh, programs that they uh, usually do every day. And so... Being able to experience that helped me grow as a person, and it helped me realize that we do really have a strong sense of community, and that um, I would like to participate in like any events that help us as a together grow. And um, past um, public school, uh, I intend to do journalism. I think. Uh, yeah, I was told it wasn't like really what I thought it was, but I'm still going after it, and I, I really do want to, because I like writing, not going to lie, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I can say your speech is really well written, so I can understand that that's a passion for you, or at least I see it in what you shared with us, and, and to... Um, mom and parents are here so c thank you and congratulations for bringing your kids it's amazing so other folks anything else yeah i would just again i don't know if there's a, a brother duo yeah, in the right. state or nation that have both won the youth the young youth of the year and the youth of the year Not that I know. so you all may be a first and as as Laron shared um he was a participant in last year's youth of the year and didn't win so he could have gave up 
But you know someone was watching you, right? Yep. Standing right next to you. And yep. you went after it again. Yes, sir. And look what happened. That expired. <laughs> yes, it did. Uh, it did. <laughs> Guys, the limit for both of you. And so you will be the youth of the year, the big youth of the year soon, the Corey. Thank you. All right, and mom, dad here, wave. Thanks so much Thank for being here. Thank you so much. Yes. I might need to Corey to stay and root us on for the rest of the meeting, but we'll, <laughs> we'll move on to character strong leaders. Um, uh, Dina Johnston is here to help us and Dr. Johnson and Kylie Luckett. Good evening. Thank you for having us here tonight. That's going to be a really hard act to follow, so, uh, but I'll, we'll do our best. Um, with the work at the foundation, um, we've been both blessed and blown away to be a part of an organization and witness the work that goes on within our schools and within our community, and to have the opportunity to meet so many amazing people along the way. Last year, with the support of the generous community and donors, business partners, donations, in-kind gifts, and volunteer service through the Lawrence Schools Foundation, the Lawrence Education Achievement Partners um, enabled us to provide more than $1.5 million in direct support for our academics, technology, athletics, the arts, and other student staff and school needs. But the work that we do through the foundation would certainly not be possible without the support and dedication of our LEAP partners. Tonight we are pleased to introduce uh, one of those partners to you. So if the Invista team would like to step, come up and join us. Come on up. Tonight we are pleased to introduce uh, you to the Invista team, They're both from the Lawrence area and the Topeka community. Uh, earlier this year, Invista Credit Union uh, partnered with Kansas Athletics and the Lawrence Schools Foundation to help impact teachers and students from kindergarten to college. When KU wins, Invista gives, in which for every sport and every game that KU wins, Invista donated money to the Lawrence Schools Foundation. Their generous gift of $25,000 helped provide us with the funds to support third grade arts day, our August back to school new shoes for students and families in need, and to help support the character strong curriculum this year across the district. So we wanted to share with you as board members as well as our partners with Invista, the incredible impact this program and their partnership has created among our students who are being recognized this evening. Uh, before I turn it over to Dr. Johnson and Kylie to introduce these students, I wanted to allow Ron the president and CEO of Invista to introduce his team and share a few words. Is he? He's right behind, Hi. Oh. He's right behind me, so. He <laughs> snuck up on me. Nobody told me I was going to have to follow a couple of outstanding oh, young speakers like that, yeah. but I guess it's too late to sneak out the back door, so I'll have to, I'll have to carry through. But good evening. I am Ron Smeltzer, president and CEO of Invista. You know, I've always believed that character and integrity form the foundation for virtually all positive attributes uh, that we have as humans, and it can serve as a springboard to future success in life. So we are very uh, pleased to have an opportunity tonight to recognize these outstanding young folks who are being acknowledged, and we're proud to be a part of that. One of Invista's core values is making an impact on the communities that we serve. And we take that responsibility very seriously. When we entered into our partnership with KU Athletics in 2022, our goal was to leverage that partnership into something impactful for the Lawrence community as a whole. And we were excited at the opportunity to use KU Gives, or uh, KU Wins and Vista Gives, they're not giving us anything, <laughs> KU Wins and Vista Gives to help fulfill some of the important needs that Lawrence schools have. In 2023, the money we donated helped support a variety of things like um, the uh, back to school shoe event, a third grade art program in, in connection with the LEAD Center, and the Character Strong program that we recognize tonight. <coughs> Invested set a, a goal of raising $25,000 through our KU partnership, but KU didn't win enough games this year. <laughs> And we only raised $21,375. <clears throat> but we're going to honor our commitment tonight by presenting a check for $25,000 to the Lawrence Schools Foundation. 
And I want to thank you for letting us share in this outstanding program. And we look forward to our continuing support of Lawrence Schools. Thank you very much. Good evening to everyone. It is an honor to be able to salute um, our character strong leaders and character strong champions um, from our school. Our champions are spread throughout our entire district, but tonight we are going to honor and celebrate these 12. Here we begin. Glasses on. So when we call your name, if you'll go ahead and come up here, please. And can I ask if you would hold your applause to the very, very end? I know it's going to be hard, but hold your applause to the very end, and then we'll just have a celebration at the very, very end. The first student is Trey Wilson, eighth grader at Billy Mills Middle School. Trey is a high character student who sets an example for what we want students at Billy Mills to be. He is kind and makes our school a better place. Haven Littlehead, fifth grade, Cordley Elementary. Haven is a true leader by example and someone who consciously chooses to do the right thing all of the time. She's a true character strong champion in that she is driven not by compliance to the rules, but rather has a strong personal integrity and love and care for the people around her. Skylar Payne, fourth grade, Deerfield Elementary. Skylar served on Deerfield Student Council in the fall. Skylar demonstrates the three R's, respectful, responsible, and ready to learn on a consistent basis across all environments at school. She is kind, self-motivated, smart, funny, and a great friend to all. She has a natural curiosity about the world and the people in it. Out of the character traits we have learned so far, like kindness, perseverance, empathy, responsibility, Skylar is a steady, Example of all of them all. Levi Collins, fifth grade, Hillcrest Elementary. Levi is such a hard worker. He tries his very best in all subjects throughout the day. He is kind to his classmates and helps anyone in need. He is very polite and respectful at school. He is a good friend and helps everyone to feel included. He always offers to help teachers with extra work and is very responsible. Levi is a great student and a character strong champion. Henry Kaufman, third grade, Langston Hughes. Henry is a student who encompasses all core values. Day in and day out, he is always willing to help a classmate or anyone in need. He is the perfect role model and the mentor for his peers. He ensures everyone is included, both in and out of the classroom. He loves to stay after school to help organize and clean up the classroom. Lola Martin, senior, Free State High School. Lola is an exceptional leader in and out of the classroom. She is a member of the Free State National Honor Society, the Free State Spirit Squad, and is a student leader in the interpersonal skills class at Free State. She is a member of a studio competition dance team and belongs to the National Charity League, which is a mother-daughter volunteer organization. Maya Worley, eighth grade, Liberty Memorial Central Middle School. Maya is an eighth grade student who can always be counted on when we need something, whether it's whether it be for a class project to help a teacher or to help other students or for the school. She has, a, she has excellent skills in getting along with others, working with people from a variety of backgrounds, and helping students navigate middle school successfully. We need you, Maya. I love it. Maya is kind and um, empathetic individual and really cares about her peers. Ellie Osborne, second grade, New York Elementary. Ellie is a great leader at New York Elementary. She gives her best effort and everything that she does. Ellie demonstrates all of the character traits that we know are important to being a great friend and scholar. Ellie's greatest strength is that she is kind to everyone and meets, she meets and is respectful at all times. Jackson Rainey, eighth grade, Southwest Middle School. With politeness and respect, he consistently uplifts his peers and fosters a culture of inclusivity and kindness. As a studious leader, he inspires others, others through his dedication to academic excellence and his willingness to guide fellow students towards success. Jackson Rainey truly exemplifies the essence of character strong champion, embodying the qualities that define leadership and companion, compassion in our schools. Cadence Daniels, fifth grade, Sunflower Elementary. Cadence is the definition of a leader in the classroom. She is kind, passionate, and loving to all around her. She sees the very best in everybody, including herself. She pushes herself when times get hard. She is an incredible young lady. Baylin Garcia, fourth grade, Sunset Hill Elementary. 
Balin is a true Sunset Hill eagle who embodies the qualities of exceptional leadership and true character. Her influence on those around her is undeniably positive as she consistently demonstrates the character strong traits both in and out of the school. Ba Balin always treats her peers and teachers with respect, recognizing and appreciating their unique perspectives. With her strong sense of responsibility, she takes initiative and works with unwavering commitment. Tia Canada. 8th grade, West Middle School. Tia exemplifies each and every one of the character strong core values of patience, kindness, honesty, respect, selflessness, forgiveness, commitment, and humility. Tia is an outstanding student that cares deeply for her education and her peers. She is a quiet leader who sets the example of being a stellar individual by strongly following the three R's in our building. Last but certainly not least, please welcome Jameer Tanner, 3rd grade, Woodlawn Elementary. Jameer's exceptional emotional intelligence and genuine interest in learning set him apart. Jameer stands out for his ability to understand and appreciate different perspectives, fostering inclusivity in the classroom. Despite his young age, he's known for his positive attitude and genuine care for his classmates. Please, let's give all of our character strong leadership a round of applause. Please stay tuned for next month's meeting. We will share, or the next, the next meeting in two weeks, we will share details about our one-year update regarding Character Strong. So get ready, get ready, get ready. Thank you. Thank you all for everything that you've done in your schools and, and um, the character, the strength of your character that you've shown and the parents that helped instill that in them. Thank you for coming tonight and um, we're really proud. Thank you. Uh, and I think the folks from Invista are walking. Are they, thank you very much for helping us do this and for being a part of it and being the kind of community partners that we hope we see in others. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay, we're going to move on to recognize retirements. Okay, we'd like to celebrate the retirement of two people tonight. Um, First is Patricia Curtail. Uh, we'd like to thank her for her 25 years of service and devotion to her community and its schools. We'd also like to thank and recognize Elizabeth Gaines for her 45 years of service and dedication to the community and its schools. Thank you. Okay, um, we now have uh, the pleasure to welcome Lawrence Virtual Schools uh, students who are going to provide us a presentation on um, a project that they've done that, that will inform uh, some of the work we do here in the district. But we're going to give it just a minute while folks are exiting, if that's okay, Principal Harwood, if that's good. So do we know if everybody's online, Kylie, can hear us? <laughs> okay. 
because I'm not very happy about that. Should it just be the four okay. students? Dr. Harwood, would you like to join us? So we have Principal Harwood here from Lawrence Virtual Schools, and I'm gonna to leave to you to introduce your students, if that's okay. They all on now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we have uh, the work of three incredible young scientists. Uh, they've been doing a lot of work around AI, looking at both public perception of it, as well as doing some really, I think, impressive scientific work testing it. Um, and so I just wanna, it is uh, Daniel Dow, Lawrence Dow, Indian Pract, they are, they've been working with uh, Ms. Nancy Jackson uh, on an e-cyber mission project. And I, I wanna thank them first for their leadership on this issue because it's something I think impacts all of us and I'm incredibly excited for you to see what they've been working on. Thank you. All right, Nancy, you should be able to unmute and let us or go ahead and start. Right. Do you guys all have the PowerPoint presentation that the boys are going to be working from? We do. Yes, we do. Okay. All right. I believe Daniel's going to start. Um, could you please show, um, share the presentation on the like, screen in the meeting? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. How are you all doing today? Hey, Daniel, we're working on the volume here. Just one moment. All right, Daniel, try that again. Good evening. How are you all doing, John? Great. Great. Fantastic. Good. Good. Well, I'd like to thank you all for having us today and allowing us to present it. The title of our presentation is Embrace It, Educate With It, Don't Eliminate. The items on our agenda are going to be our introduction, status quo, survey results, our experiment results, some do's and don'ts, some final takeaways, and finally a Q&A session. Our team has three members, Daniel, Ian, and Lawrence. The community issue we decided to tackle for our project is the absence of discussion, education, and support concerning AI literacy, AI tools such as ChatGPT in our community. The goal of our project is to raise awareness about this issue, to share knowledge, and offer suggestions to address the issue in our community. The focuses of our project are to, one, gain insights into our community's perception of generative AI ChatGPT and understand our community's level of interest in the issue. To accomplish this, we create surveys to delve deeper into the topic. Secondly, to evaluate ChatGPT's reasoning capabilities in a scientific way by experiencing firsthand what the tool can do by using it. We conducted experiments on ChatGPT testing the tool's mathematical reasoning. We chose math because it's our team member's favorite subject, and it's easier to validate than other subjects. So we have, next, we have some background information on our project. We use ChatGPT 3.5, a generative AI tool released to the world on November 30th, 2022. It can generate human-like conversations from simple users' prompts. It supports 50 languages hundreds of millions of subscribers worldwide. Our district, USD 497, blocked access to ChatGPT on district-issued iPads for both teachers and students. No formal discussion and guidance on the topic of AI literacy, generative AI technology, and its tools in our district. Additionally, the Kansas Board of Education has issued no guidance on the topics so far. Now we're going to have a look at our survey results. We surveyed four groups of stakeholders in our community to gain insights into how they perceive generative AI technology and chat GPT. The 
surveys online using Google Forms. Participants were sent links to surveys via email. It was voluntary participation and we offered no incentives. There were eight questions on the surveys and we had 159 respondents or a 40% response rate. The four groups in our and the four groups we surveyed are Elvis Middle School students, Elvis Middle School parents, Elvis teachers, USC 497 teachers. Um, I need to see the map. For, question, for the first question, we asked the participants how familiar are they with the artificial intelligence technology ChatGPT. The USD 497 teacher group showed the highest level of familiarity compared to other groups. 32% in total we were moderately familiar, very familiar, and extremely familiar categories. The second question, we asked the participants whether or not they have used the ChatGPT AI platform. The USD 497 teacher group reported a 71% response rate for yes, which is the highest among the groups. This was followed by the LVS teacher group, 60%. Now I'm going to hand it over to Ian. All right. Uh, my name is Ian Plott, and I'm going to continue talking about our survey results because there's a lot of it. <laughs> um, so on question four. We asked about the positive benefits of chat, GBT, and similar AI tools and school environments. Um, for the LVS middle school students, they, our top three were homework assistance, writing, and learning tools such as assistance and coding and math. All groups agreed that chat, GBT can benefit students most in writing like editing tools and learning. Question five was um, sort of the opposite question. In what ways do you think that chat GPT and AI tools would negatively impact students in school environments? So student and parent groups were mostly concerned that students would become over reliant on chat GBT and it could lead to cheating in school. Teacher groups um, also were concerned that students may become too dependent on chat GBT and that students may use these tools to cheat. And they were also concerned that students could receive inaccurate or biased information from the tools. Question six um, was a question about how should school systems respond to the use of chat, GPT, and similar AI tools? So all of the groups agreed that schools need to educate and hold discussions about the pros and cons of these tools and how to use them properly and how to update their academic integrity policy and rethink assignments. Um, a third of the LVS parent group thought that ChatGPT should be banned. This is the highest um, among these four groups. And the LVS student groups showed the highest response rate for the option of allowing students to have access to ChatGPT in schools. Question seven was a question about um, agreement or disagreement with the following statement. There was a gray area of I don't know. Um, so we asked if they agreed or disagreed with the following sentence, which is, should chat GPT be allowed in schools? 60% of the LVS students said yes. 50% of the LVS teachers said that they did not know. 50% Sorry, 56% of the USC 490, USC 497 teachers agreed, and 59% uh, of the LVS parents did not agree. 
Uh, keep in mind that these are the highest percentages of choices from each group. Um, in total, if you look at all of these, 54% agreed that ChatGPT should be allowed in schools, 29% did not know, and 17% disagreed. Uh, question eight was a optional question. Um, however, we did get many responses. Um, this is an open-ended question that asked if anyone had any other opinions on chat UBT. Students mostly appear to be the ones interested with chat GPT and also pointed out that it is a only a tool and should not be fully relied on for schoolwork. Parents agreed that educating students on chat GPT is essential for proper use. Teachers agreed education was necessary and compared AI tools to when the internet was first introduced to schools and how people were at first resentful to that until it was um, until it was integrated into the school system. All groups realized that ChatGPT is a powerful tool and that education about how to properly use it is vital. Um, the teachers said that if one is familiar with ChatGPT, they will more likely agree to have it in schools, and they offered more insights. Other platforms were also mentioned, such as Google's Bard, and there were more concerns about the reliability of how these AI tools are trained with information on the internet and not fully understanding the consequences. Overall, there was a lot of interest, though, in chat GPT in schools. Now we get into the experiment results. We asked questions. Uh, we asked questions. We asked questions um, to the chat GPT 3.5 version. And these are the results that we got. So, then first off, experiment set up. There were three data sets. The first one was three randomly selected problems um, and three different math concepts published by the New York State Education Department for grade eight mathematical assessment from 2021 to 2023. Our second data set was 30 randomly selected problems and five different math concepts by the College Board and their May 30th, 2023 SAT practice tests. And the third data set was 30 more randomly selected problems and five math concepts ranging from easy to hard, easy to hard published by the Art of Problem Solving and a book called Competition Math for Middle School by author Jay Batterson in August of 2009. There are two testers, that would be Daniel and Lawrence, and they had different user accounts and five experiments, each on different dates and times, followed identical procedures. There were two prompts for each problem. Prompt one asked the chat GPT to solve this problem and provide the answer. Prompt two was a little different. It asked them to solve this problem and show how they did it step by step. The process was to manually enter two, these two types of prompts into chat GPT's message box for each problem. 180 prompts among both testers was taken for each experiment, so 900 prompts for each tester total or a total of 1,800 prompts. And these were all recorded on a tracking sheet. And with that, I will pass it to Lawrence. So, the goals of our experiment were to 
test how the accuracy of the generated responses by ChatGPT changes when datasets, user accounts, prompts, and experiment times are altered, and to also test how reliable the tool is. Um, this is our experiment results. Both of our testers recorded the average accuracy score by ChatGPT for five experiments in the charts below. As you can see, for the data set state assessment 8th grade, tester 2.2 had a 94.7% average accuracy score and answered 28.4 out of 30 questions correctly. For data set 2, College Board SAT practice tests, tester 2.2 answered 91.3%, had a 91.3% average accuracy score, and answered 27.4 questions out of 30 questions correctly. For our last data set, auto problem solving middle school competition problems, tester 2.2 had a um, 56% average accuracy score and answered 16.8 out of 30 questions correct. For our experiment findings, ChatGPT can generate responses to our prompts within a few seconds. It had consistent performance throughout the experiments. We experienced an instance where ChatGPT encountered errors and was unable to produce a solution. It can also produce elaborate responses with step-by-step -step reasoning for the problems we tested. It performed very well for state assessment in College Board SAT datasets. Responses with the same level of accuracy can vary in length, the amount of text, and structure. This are experiment findings, too. For some questions, ChatGPT generated completely different responses for the prompts and for the testers. If ChatGPT does not know how to answer a question, it can create or make up varying answers for the same user on different dates. These, this term is called this AI terms is called hallucinations. Some questions will require specific approaches to resolve. ChatGPT struggled with these kinds of problems. Its responses were all incorrect throughout the experiment. It can also make simple calculation mistakes or generate nonsensical responses. Sometimes, if it does not understand the question, asking for a four-digit number returning a three-digit number. Other things we learned. ChatGPT is a giant artificial neural network with about 175 billion connections which are mathematical functions with billions of terms. ChatGPT was trained using 300 billion words or 570 gigabytes of data. The US, the, the US Department of Education issued a report called Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Teaching and Learning, Insights and Recommendations in May 2023 to provide leadership on the topic. Out of all 51 state departments of education, just two states, California and Oregon, have offered official guidance to school districts on using AI in schools in 2023. Other things we learned. On December 12, 2022, the Los Angeles Unified School District the blocked ChatGPT on school Wi-Fi and district-owned student devices. On, on October 12, 2023, the Los Angeles Unified School District announced that all students ages 13 and above would have access to generative AI tools. New York City Public Schools banned ChatGPT on January 3, 2023 due to concerns over cheating. However, on May 18, 2023, New York City's Department of Education unbanned ChatGPT and outlined the school system's plans to engage with ChatGPT. Other things we learned. Wichita Public Schools, a 50,000 student district in Kansas, embraced ChatGPT soon after it was introduced. In April 2023, the entire faculty and staff of the district were given access to ChatGPT, then participated in a district-wide summer ChatGPT camp to understand the chatbot and its use in classrooms. 
Robin Wood Public Schools USD 453 became the first district in Kansas to embrace Magic School AI Innovators, a generative AI platform designed to support teachers within its community. We had an interview with Mr. Potter, Director of Public Relations, and he offered us insights into the implementation of the AI platform in his district. If you want to, if you want to know more about the interview, we can send you after the presentation is over. A survey conducted by Lindenwood University in September 2023 of 4,528 K-12 educators across 50 states in Puerto Rico highlighted several obstacles hindering the integration of AI technologies in schools. Among these, the necessity to, pro to provide educators with sufficient training and support, including remedies to their knowledge gaps, emerged as a prominent barrier. Educators expressed concerns regarding time and costs associated with AI implementation in classrooms, alongside the access of essential resources like dependable high-speed internet and hardware. Other things we learned. Four large-scale studies have been conducted on the topic. The first survey by study.com surveyed 230 K-12 teachers about the use of ChatGPT in February 2023. 80% of teachers have heard of ChatGPT, 72% of teachers have not received any faculty guidance on ChatGPT, and 67% of teachers do not believe ChatGPT should be banned in schools. The second survey by Pew Research Center in September 2023, surveying 1,453 U.S. teens aged 13 to 17 about the use of ChatGPT for schoolwork. 75% of surveyed U.S. teens say they have heard of ChatGPT, including 23% who have heard a lot about it. 69% of the respondents say it is acceptable to use ChatGPT for researching new ideas. The third study by Intelligent.com surveyed 3,017 high school and college students in ages ranged 16 to 24, along with 3,234 parents of younger students in May 2023. 85% of high school and college students surveyed say studying with ChatGPT is more effective than studying with a tutor. 95% of students and parents of students surveyed say their grades have gotten better since they or their children started studying with ChatGPT. The last survey jointly conducted by Impact Research and Walton Family Foundation. A survey of 1,002 U.S. K-12 teachers and 1,000 U.S. students aged 12 to 17 in February 2023 and about how they use ChatGPT in schools. 51% of teachers reported using ChatGPT with 40% using it at least once a week and 53% expecting to use it more this year. Here's a list of do's and don'ts in ChatGPT that we compiled during our research. These are just some suggestions and they are not exhaustive lists. You should use it as a learning partner for ideas, use it to design a study plan, use it to help understand basic concepts, use it to understand your problems and steps, use it to review your lessons, use it to learn a new language, use it to learn coding, provide with it clear prompts, play word games, trivia games with it, explore with it, for example, creative storytelling or photography. You should not use it to cheat. Don't use it to do your homework, such as writing assignments. Don't rely on it for making decisions. Don't share with it your personal or sensitive information. Don't share with it other people's private information. Don't blindly trust everything it generates. Don't share with it your original creative work. Don't use it as a therapist. Don't use it for legal or medical advice. Don't forget about copyright laws. For example, ask for sources. Here are takeaways. If you want to learn more on this topic, you can read extensively about the topics, generative AI, its tools, 
You can watch documentaries about the topics. You can talk with others about the topics. You can reach out to us for more conversations. You can experiment with ChatGPT and other tools. And you can explore emerging careers with generative AI. Here is how you can advocate for change in our community. You can engage in conversations. Call or write to our district IT director to remove restrictions on AI tools. Call or write to our local school administrators or state administrators to request guidance on AI technology in schools. Request AI literacy to be included in the local and state curricula. Thank you for taking your time to listen to our presentation. If you have any questions, we will answer them now. First, I want to say, um, holy smokes, you did a lit review, interviewed district staff. There was um, a very comprehensive and well-executed survey. The information you provided is useful in many ways to decisions we would make as a board, including policy, and also um, procedures and policies we might put in place for both student staff and district leadership. Uh, you've given me so much to think about. I'm not even sure where to start. Um, so thank you very much for the presentation. I'm definitely going to reach back out to you all for additional conversation. I think the policy committee has much to consider under this issue. And now I will pause and open it up for questions. Go ahead. Um, first, I want to say um, fantastic work. This is uh, extremely helpful. Um, when I was reviewing your results um, in preparation for tonight's meeting, one thing that I noticed um, in the survey results about uh, whether students, staff, parents thought that we should use chat D GPT, I, there were some results in there that were surprising to me. So I wanted to ask you if you were surprised by any of the particular results that you got from your survey. Um, did you have expectations that it would turn out one way or the other um, with any particular group? And, and did any of it surprise you? And then after you answer the question, I'll tell you which one surprised me. Well, I think that I assumed the teachers would be flexible with whichever way it would go. Like, well, not that, but um, it would be they would be flexible, like maybe a little split. And then the students, I think that I assume that they would go toward the it, allow chat GPT in school side. And the rest of the outcomes didn't really surprise me that much, except the parents. Mm -hmm. Perhaps what interested me the most um, was that the student seems to be the most, almost the most educated. Um, right up there next to the teachers who have been to those kinds of workshops like Lawrence mentioned and you know they were they seemed like they were more open to chat GPT than the parents were um, I'm not sure if that is because there's less education or if it's just a concern um, from the parents that they want their kids to do well in school, which is a valid concern. The, um, the parents only had 24 people, though, as respondents out of, um, of, out of 86 people. So it was about only 28% of respondents from the parents. But, and it's it's the lowest response rate in our like presentation. I mean, in our survey results, it was not surprising to me. Really. Great. Well, I really appreciate your reflections on that. I will tell you, I was I expected when I when I was reading your questions that the students would be the most enthusiastic about allow, allowing as, access. Um, and I was surprised when the results were that the teachers were even more open to that possibility. Um, and given yeah. that, that this is not a tool that we make available, I think that gives our policy committee a lot of interesting uh, data to consider as we um, talk about whether we need to adopt policy. Um, and I, it's my belief that we do as a district need to adopt policy around this. So um, thank you again for your great work. Yeah, and I think the policy extends into academic integrity policy. Absolutely agreed with that point. And then also just the utilization. And you've given us good districts to look at models. So I appreciate that. 
Um, other, I, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Me? Okay. Um, <clears throat> amazing job. Um, I myself am still in the very early stages of learning about this. Um, one of the um, things at the conference I just attended was talking about the importance of prompt writing and prompt engineers as a career. They can make like $375,000 because it's such, like there are so few people that can do it well. So I thought that was interesting. Um, and obviously perhaps a need that we need to add into the curricula as well um, as far as teaching students how to use this. What would you, do you have any recommendations um, about the use of AI in our schools? based off what you've learned? Um, I think we should definitely develop a task force, including um, all stakeholders um, that we surveyed and discuss the matter. We also need to develop guidelines on how to use it appropriately and how to use it responsibly. We also need to train the teachers, because um, if we train the teachers, then students can follow that. As far as using it in school goes, it's very useful for things like uh, coding. I've personally used it for my own coding projects before, and it's very helpful in that way. And as technology improves and progresses, I'm beginning to think that coding classes are going to become more of a necessity um, in schools. And ChatGPT and other things like that could be a very useful tool for those kinds of things. GR, did you have? Yeah, um, I'll just really quick echo what everybody said. It was a great presentation. Um, I liked, I like what you said there at the end about, you know, making sure that we get, as we work on policy and as, as, as we work on doing this, getting stakeholders to the table and, and making sure that we have some policies in place and we have some guidelines in place, both for staff and for students. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I don't believe you're, you're advocating for us to flip flip the switch to turn it on tonight. Um, but I think I, I think you gave us a lot of things to think about to 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 lead us down that path. I think it's the right path. Um, I I for one have been using Jet GPT for a very long time. I use Copilot every day um, uh, in VS Code. Uh, so it's something I'm quite familiar with. I'm quite familiar with the benefits and 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 how to use it. Um, effectively and appropriately, and 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 so I think I think a lot of the things that you brought up today, um, the, the things that you learned through your experimentation, the the points that 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 you were able to bring to the table, uh, as Kelly said, were all very thorough and organized, and um, and and really laid um, some really great foundation for us to move forward from. So great work, and thank you for for bringing it to us and taking the time and. Come it's really awesome. Thank you again for your time and your interest. Well, uh, this is Carol. I just want to thank you for bringing this uh, to us for our attention. And I just wanted to, I don't, I'm sure you are aware of this, but the Peninsula School District in Washington State was one of the first schools to put out guidance on using artificial intelligence in the classroom. And the, the school actually used, AI, they actually used GPT chat to develop their policy and we will take this into consideration and consider, look at the um, Department of Education's guidance for artificial intelligence and creating policy. And on the, in the back of the report, there are seven key recommendations and I'll forward you all the report. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Dr. Lewis. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, again, I've, Thank you all for this um, report. I agree with Kelly. You really laid this out in a way that's almost like a dissertation. I was about to, ready to ask you, did you go? Did this go through IRB? Mm -hmm. um, but you also you did a did a great job. And our job as as educators and as a school system uh, is to prepare today's students for your future, for their future, not necessarily our our past. And so part of that is looking at this from a policy standpoint, from a practices standpoint. 
which those policies and practices should be in place to teach our students to be discerning consumers and producers of AI generated content. And so uh, it's not going anywhere and we, as a school system we have to embrace it. And I was reading something recently that if school systems are not talking about AI today, they're not preparing their students for their future. We've been having some conversations <laughs> uh, in ELT uh, about it as well. Obviously there's generative AI which you talked about tonight, but also school systems can use predictive AI mm -hmm. that will um, uh, help us in terms of predicting students outcomes based, based on you know, data. Uh, in terms of graduation and other things. So um, I'm happy to, that our board is considering um, adopting policy around this. I would, I guess I would ask ELT in part of your conversation, I do like this idea of a task force. I don't know that we've used that word before, but I think that's that's a good idea in terms of um, bringing together stakeholders. So I appreciate that yep. recommendation and, and I think that's probably something we can put together. Yep. I think we we'll probably have some members of the task force on, on the screen. Uh, Gwinnett County, school district actually established a, an office in their school district, Office of Artificial Intelligence. Um, that's just how serious school districts are getting about this. Um, thank you so much for giving us your time tonight. Uh, and to Ms. Jackson, you've been quiet, but we appreciate the guidance that you've provided your students and the uh, mentorship and the educating you've done so that they could put this together for us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, y'all. Really, good job. Uh, Thank you. So you'll be hearing from us. We appreciate Bye. it. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Principal Harwood. All right, we're gonna um, recess to executive session. Can I get a motion? I move the Board of Education recess to executive session to protect the public interest in negotiating a fair and equitable contract to, to discuss negotiations pursuant to the exception for employer-employee negotiations under COMA with Dr. Anthony Lewis, Cindy Frick, Dr. Cynthia Johnson, Kristen Ryan, Dr. Larry Ingebrick, and Kevin Harrell invited to be present and with the board to return to open session at 7.30 with no action to follow. Is there a second? Second. Jones? Yes. Byers? Yes. Kimball? Yes. Kadu Blackwood? Yes. Costello? Yes. Franklin? Yes. Gordon Ross? Yes. Motion passes 7-0.
and we'll return to open session. We're moving on to a report of the superintendent of schools. Awesome. Thank you, President Jones. Good evening, board members, um, members of the public in attendance and online. Happy to share that this year's, um, this year's MOU with the LEA regarding our middle school schedule uh, has sunset. And as a result, the district will return to the current language and the current language that's in the negotiated agreement uh, with middle school educators teaching six of eight periods. I certainly appreciate the certified negotiations team for its ongoing uh, efforts and discussions of how to best serve our students and improve working conditions for our staff, uh, considering the limited funds available to our district. Last night was our final, or the board's final, uh, beyond the boardroom of this school year. And so many thanks to the board members and the members of the public, including students that came out to have conversation with our board members. Also thanks to board past president Shannon Kimball uh, and our Lawrence Schools Foundation Executive Director Dina Johnston for sharing updates about Lawrence Public Schools and the foundation at the Chamber, Chamber's Government and Community Affairs luncheon today. Several scholar honors uh, to let you know about. Um, KNEA awarded top honors this past weekend to Lawrence High's junior Adele Erickson in its student expression campaign. Uh, it encourages young creators to speak their truth on social justice through visual arts, music, spoken word, and video or photography. Adele spoke and was honored at the KNEA Delegate Assembly in Wichita. Uh, her artwork, which speaks to the sexualization of women in the media, get this, it will be reproduced on a grand scale and displayed on the side of the KNEA headquarters building in Topeka for next year. So that's a, literally a huge honor. Uh, her artwork will be displayed on side of a building. Uh, Free State is celebrating a second speech and debate team member, Junior Anwin uh, Williams, I hope I pronounced your first name correctly, earning premier distinction, the highest degree in the National Speech and Debate Association Honor Society. And this is certainly no easy feat. Fewer than 3% of its members achieve this level prior to graduation. Uh, many of you may recall senior Sophie Racy earned premier distinction in December. So this is certainly a true testament to Mr. Kelly Thompson's um, uh, uh, so expertise as the speech and debate coach at Free State. Speaking of Firebirds debate, three Free State alumni who are now attending KU have been in the news this week. Congratulations to Cecilia uh, C.C. Poranjathi. Um, named the 2024 National Goldwater Scholar. She is a junior studying inorganic chemistry at KU with the goal of improving the efficiency of sustainable sources of energy. KU debate team member John, John Marshall, a Free State class of 2022 member, was the member of the team placing fifth at the national debate tournament. Marshall was ranked the 18th individual speaker nationally, and he, is, uh, he and his teammate were the eighth ranked team in the country entering the tournament. They made it to the quarterfinals, where they met, met and were replaced by high-seeded KU's team that went on to finish second in the nation. In addition, the KU debate team that included Jacob Wilkins of uh, Free State's class of 2021 finished four of four in national preliminary rounds. Certainly always gratifying to see and to hear about the many things that our scholars are doing as they continue their college success. Past President uh, Shannon Kimball and board member G.R. Gordon Ross presented information about the district's launch of its private fiber wide area network during last week's National School Board Association Conference in New Orleans. Uh, in addition to sharing their experience with other school districts, uh, their presentation was featured in an article on GovTech.com, an online magazine covering information technology's role in the state and local government. So thank you, Shannon and G.R. for uh, sharing the work that we're doing here nationally. Our district's elementary um, students have checked out a whopping 108,747 books from their school libraries through the third quarter of this year. Uh, those numbers are thanks in no small part to the phenomenal people working in our libraries. And so this week we ask that you help us celebrate all of our library media specialists and assistants during National Library Week and National Library Month. Thank you for always being advocates for education and for cultivating skills that benefit students for the rest of their lives. 
Congratulations to Kristen Oswald, Swegler's third grade teacher, and Lori Byers, Billy Mills Middle School gifted education teacher. They are our nominees for the Kansas Teacher of the Year program. They were both honored Sunday at the state's Region 2 um, awards banquet in Topeka. There on the screen is Kristen Oswald uh, with our commissioner and some other folks there, and Lori Byers. So congratulations to our two outstanding Kansas Teacher of the Year nominees. We are pleased to join Billy Mills Middle School in celebrating the selection of Sarah Reichenberger Murray uh, as Assistant Principal and Athletic Director effective July 1, pending board approval. Sarah is a Lawrence resident and currently the Director of Field Experiences and KU School of Education and Human Sciences. She's been there since 2022 and previously served our district as a curriculum and instructional coach for four years. So welcome back, um, Sarah Murray. Uh, we actually had a lot of applicants. We had close to 30 applicants uh, for some of these uh, vice principal positions, so a lot of interest in, in those positions. Last week, we celebrated National Assistant Principals Week. These de dedicated educational leaders work tirelessly to support principals, teachers, and staff, students, and school families. They build relationships, help create safe, positive learning environments, oversee athletics, activities, and facilities, and face many, many, many unpredictable challenges. So, Thank you so much to our associate and assistant principals. April 3rd was Paraprofessional Ed Appreciation Day, and this is a day that honors our paraprofessional educators, and so we're certainly thankful for our 235 paraeducators, most of which support um, students receiving special education. And so on the screen there, we're working with Lawrence, uh, I'm sorry, we're working with Langston Hughes Elementary to recognize paraeducator and lunch monitor Stephanie Moore. Stephanie's quick and effective action last week assisted a student who was choking during lunch. The student fully recovered and we are so grateful that Stephanie was there, just being there uh, at the right time to um, provide support to that student. Speaking of pairs, continuing to celebrate our pairs, many thanks to the Lawrence Schools Foundation for honoring Marie Daniels, a paraeducator and job coach at Community Connections at Pinckney with the $500 Spring Acknowledging Classified Employees, or our ACE Award last week. Marie is well-deserving of this recognition. Speaking of Community Connections, our CTRAN uh, students from Community Connections at Pinckney are Job Olympics champions. Uh, they won the post-secondary division of the Job Olympics at Johnson County Community College. Uh, these competitions test job and employability skills, and we are so, so proud of them and have um, invited these champs at our first board meeting in May to be recognized. Uh, and thanks to um, Jackson Caldwell for letting me know as soon as it happened. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of Jackson, thank you to KU Baseball for hosting CTRAN students Jackson and Tavares. They were honorary managers uh, at, its, at the KU's Baseball Annual Autism Awareness Game that was last Saturday. I want to thank MIDCO for donating uh, close to, four, oh, I think, over 4,000 pairs of safety glasses to assist us in our efforts to participate in Monday Solar Eclipse. I also appreciate all of our teachers, staff, and administrators for organizing lessons around viewing the eclipse and for providing alternative activities for students whose families and cultures do not choose to participate. Lawrence Public Schools um, actually rolled in deep uh, to Emporia State University to attend the Kansas Master Teacher Day ceremonies at Emporia last week to honor Kansas Master Teacher Jess Brown of Sunflower. She's Sunflower first grade teacher, and it was certainly a, a joy and an honor to be there as well, we, we celebrated Jess as the Kansas Master Teacher. While many of our students enjoyed spring break, our FNO maintenance staff used their time to complete some major projects throughout the, dish, uh, the district. They installed a new PTA funded playground structure and replaced a kitchen grease trap uh, plumbing receptacle at Langston Hughes. Uh, they replaced the chiller at Woodlawn and a rooftop HVAC unit at Sunset Hill. FNO staff installed new softball turf and batting cages at LHS and added acoustic sound reducing paneling and repaired custodial floor mop sinks at West Middle School at the ESC. New cabinetry, shelving, and office furniture were installed in the audiology office. In addition, what you see on your screen is solar panels were installed on the roof at Prairie Park for the district's first solar energy education project. So that is hugely exciting. 
Um, remember, this came uh, as a result of our futures planning process. This was a recommendation from the futures planning committee. And so we certainly look forward to the educational and environmental benefits of this project, as well as generating cost savings for the district's general fund. As a reminder, new student registration for the 24-25 school year is open, as well as the transfer request. You can find uh, that link on your screen there at new student registration. And for transfers, it's usd497.org forward slash transfers. Also, the annual student registration for all returning students will open April, or well, is open, it opened April 1st. Um, so please make sure our parents complete those. I completed mine last night. So my son was uh, encouraging me to complete it because they received a little squishy toy after completing. So, <laughs> hey, whatever it takes to get families to complete it. Um, so thank you to families that have completed that. Once again, our friends for, um, of the, at Cans for Community are back with an annual April Can Challenge. Help us help them recycle 5,000 pounds of aluminum cans this month with proceeds supporting our middle and high schools. You can drop off your cans at the blue cans that are housed, um, housed, I'm sorry, blue can houses located in the parking lots of grocery stores and other businesses around Lawrence. Finally, here are a couple of calendar reminders for school families. As a reminder, there's no school for students in grades early childhood through 12. That's, that'll be Friday. And uh, it is also staff professional learning and planning day. Please remember, though, that all of our schools are in session on Monday. And my final plug for Big Brothers Big Sisters partners, you will see this at every board meeting. So until you scan the QR code, you're going to see it. <laughs> um, so again, we encourage um, all members of our community to take an active part in um, the life of a child by serving as a mentor with our partnership with Big Brothers Big Sisters. That's all I have. So we'll move on to the report of the President of the Board of Education. Uh, Dr. Lewis covered the content I wanted to cover. So I'll just extend my gratitude to the teachers and the principals who helped um, support our students in seeing the eclipse yesterday. I got to speak to a second grader um, at Corley Elementary who described it as the best toenail they'd ever seen, um, which was really <laughs> amazing to me, um, and one that thought it looked a bit like a banana. So. Both really great descriptions, um, so that's all I have. Uh, and we'll move on to, we do not have um, public comment today that is not related to an agenda item. So um, we have one that's related to a report that's coming up later. It's a, we'll have you come up then if that's all right? Okay, um, so we'll now move on to board commentary. We'll start at the end and come on. Yep. Um, just a couple things uh, that I've been able to do since the last board meeting. So April 3rd, was able to go to Woodlawn Site Council, um, was able to, uh, Kristen Ryan and Ron May came and we spent the entire time talking about uh, attributes uh, that members of the Site Council uh, wanted in uh, a new principal for Woodlawn. It was a really great and productive conversation. Uh, really enjoyed just being there and listening to that conversation. Um, April 4th, uh, had uh, a negotiations meeting with um, Certified, and we talked about middle school schedule. We talked about um, updates to healthcare and um, potential changes to leave buyback. Uh, over the weekend, uh, was at the um, NSBA convention. Um, l last night, had another n negotiations meeting where we touched on middle school schedule, and then this morning um, had a facility committee meeting, uh, planning meeting that Shannon's going to touch on. Um, in the consent agenda today, just a couple things related to um, facilities and, and IT. There's a, f a final site contract addendum. Uh, final site is who manages our website. Uh, uh, it's uh, an addendum to um, integrate into Active Directory. Um, we have two um, replacement utility ve vehicles to replace uh, some. Uh, we have about six that are about 20 years old. Um, and then our um, Cenegix, uh the emergency response uh, project that we have, um, we're adding additional coverage for all of Broken Arrow. Um, and then um, the bond uh, uh, re refinancing um, resolution. Uh, is on there. We had talked about uh, putting that on, on there so it didn't need all of board approval, just the board president uh, with a target uh, savings of $2.5 million.
Thank you. Uh, Anne, I think you had some. Okay, I apologize if this is a little long, but um, I want to cover everything. So um, on March 28th, I attended a third grade music pro program at Sunflower and was super impressed with the ukulele skills of all those third graders. Um, and I love that the students there are able to learn a variety of instruments um, while they're um, in elementary school. April 2nd, I was unable to attend the ACE Award presentation um, due to a prior commitment, but wanted to congratulate Marie Daniels, who's a job coach and pair at Pink Pinkney on winning that award. Uh, April 3rd, I attended the Innovation Expo at LHS. Um, I was amazed at the beautiful art that was being produced by our students, and my family definitely ate more than our fair share of the delicious food prepared by the culinary students. And there's some recipes that I definitely want to get a hold of. Um, April 4th, I attended the negotiations committee just to watch so that I can better understand how that process works um, since I'm not on the committee and new to the board. Um, I did attend the NSBA conference over the weekend, um, attending a variety of different um, sessions, um, but I really thought that the, some of the keynote speakers there were really fantastic and had some great messages. Um, Ruby Bridges, who was the first African-American child to attend an all-white school during the Louisiana desegregation crisis, spoke, and she spoke about the importance of parents being involved in their kids' education, um, you know, reminding us that it, all, it definitely takes a village. She also talked about the importance of hope. Never think that something is impossible. The other side isn't giving up, so we must be hopeful. Um, and my kids were super excited when they found out. First, they said she's still alive, and I was like, she gets that a lot, <laughs> I think. Um, but they called learning about her in school and were super excited that I got to hear her speak. Um, and then another speaker was Dr. Timothy Shriver talking about the dignity scale and how we often look at each other and get each other wrong. It's a lot of times we sell each other short, and when we do that, it's a short road to contempt, treating each other with contempt. Um, contempt has become the language of political speech in America, and the rise of racism and anti-Semitism and violence are evidence of that. Um, we need to focus on language that is spoken on moments, in moments of conflict, and it's not that we disagree, but how we disagree, and I thought those were really important messages um, to be shared. Um, Yesterday, I attended the Sunflower Site Council meeting um, where we talked about attendance, behavior, and enrollment. Um, good news is that attendance is up 1% to 2% um, from last year generally across all weeks. Um, and then she told us about the support education program, which allows them to be proactive with some interventions outside of the school system before filing for truancy. Um, it provides tutoring if needed, and students can work towards a big reward by attending school. So I thought that was um, a great program um, to help our students out. Um, in regards to behaviors, um, she and the staff at Sunflower had a kind of a reset meeting prior to spring break to ensure that everyone knew the correct follow-ups for behaviors. Um, teachable moments, care team calls, and office referrals. Um, they were not on the same page previously. Sometimes teachable moments were put in as office referrals, et cetera. Um, they also, one of the things that they said that they learned is that, you know, if there's a pair in the room, the pair can monitor the class while the teacher took the student out into the hall for a teachable moment. Um, and since that point where they've gotten aligned on what behaviors kind of fall into which categories, they've seen a drop in care team calls and office referrals. So that's exciting news. Um, and then she spoke about enrollment. So we, they have 95th graders moving up to middle school next year. Um, so far, they only had 45 kinders or students, future kindergartners registered, but she knew that, um, believed that the number would definitely increase, but won't, doesn't expect it to come close to the 90. So just another example of us exiting more students than are coming in. Um, I attended my first Beyond the Boardroom last night. I was pleased with the turnout and definitely excited to see students there bringing ideas to the board. I thought that was really awesome. Um, and I definitely hope this is something that we continue to have um, as the board. And then finally, this morning, I was able to harass GR, who is still helping out as a crossing guard, which I think is awesome, so. <coughs> Okay, um, hi, this is Carol. I will try to be brief. Um, let's see, uh, let's see. On April 2nd, my colleague and I, Bob Byers, we attended the Equity Advisory Council Committee meeting. And we would like to thank everybody for their engagement and participation. And we, we broke into groups and we, uh, we drafted dra uh, definitions from the Equity Advisory Council uh, for the family engagement definitions, and we will be submitting those to Dr. Lewis for his consideration on April 16th. 
And let's see. And I'm encouraging those members who are on the Equity Advisory Council to please open up your email and look at those um, suggestions. Uh, let's see. Thursday, April 11th, I um, the Sunset Hill Site Council will be having their parent committee meeting at 5 o'clock in the conference room. Um, Monday, April 15th, Schweigler, the Schweigler Site Council will have their Site Council committee meeting at 5.30. And Tuesday, April 16th, Billy Mills Middle School will be hosting their uh, Site Council committee meeting as well. And just some free events, uh, just putting this out there for PSA. The KU First Nations Powwow will be held this weekend on Saturday from 10.30 to 8.00. It's a free family fun event, and I will be volunteering there. So if you see me, just come stop by and wave. Um, let's see. And on Saturday, April 20th, the Watkins Museum is hosting a Lawrence Earth Day Fair for families. And um, I'm very excited to see that our solar panels are up and running at Prairie Park Elementary. And just to th that end, I just um, want to thank this board for their work, their continued work on what we, my tribe, we have a word term for Mother Earth Sigma Qua. So I, I am very encouraged and happy about this board as we look for ways to continue to reduce our impacts on Mother Earth. Thank you. All right, I'm going to start with this week and then go to last week. Um, so uh, really appreciated all the uh, community members and students who came out for Beyond the Boardroom last night. We had a great turnout um, and some uh, informative conversations. Um, GR and I did have our uh, monthly facilities meeting today. Um, wanted to share a couple of things that GR hadn't mentioned about things that, that we learned. FNO staff has started providing a monthly update on our facilities usage. And I think it's really um, informative when you to know that our facilities in the, just the month of March were reserved for 1,100 events that were held. Um, so the, the, the usage of our buildings for both uh, district-related and outside of district-related events is quite high. Um, and I appreciate all the work that our FNO staff have put into um, uh, creating processes and procedures to uh, assist with that and make that a, a more seamless and transparent process. To that end, the board should know that uh, probably in May we're going to be seeing a revised facility rental guide that uh, FNO has been working on for quite some time, and they're going to be bringing that to the board for approval. Um, in addition, we got updates on a number of projects. We are going to be doing some uh, uh, a fair number of roofing projects this summer. Uh, we'll touch on six different school buildings and um, uh, the largest of which is going to be at Lawrence High School. So I know we've heard, um, we've heard some, uh, some feedback about some of the places that we need to be doing that work and so it looks like that's going to be in process for this summer. Uh, the board should expect to see in the coming month or so um, in our, at our second April meeting, uh, we did do another round of um, uh, another request for bids on the East Heights property, and we will be seeing some follow-up on that at our board meeting on April 22nd. We're also going to be seeing um, some uh, so, uh, some work around our printers that we use in our print shop, um, band and orchestra instruments for next school year, and also um, there's going to be a paving project by Corley Elementary, and we're going to be doing some updating of our parking areas um, in, in a relation to that particular project. Um, okay, I uh, wanted to say a quick thank you to the Lawrence Chamber for inviting me to give an update on the district today at their government affairs luncheon. It was a lot of fun to give that update along with uh, an update that Dina Johnston, our dr executive director of our schools foundation, gave on the work that the foundation does to support our district. Um, so I appreciated being able to have that opportunity to share. Um, and then I wanted to go back to last week to give a quick legislative update, if I may. Um, the good news, we actually had some positive movement on the budget as it relates to special education. Um, it's not final. Um, through a series of events, um, the original proposal that was not as positive for schools was actually voted down in the Senate last Thursday. Um, which I think in, in my many years of following this, it might be the first time I remember a, a budget being defeated on the floor um, once it had been sent out of conference. Um, it, that was a very big deal because the thing that 
um, that really tipped, tipped the conversation was an attempt to rewrite the special education funding formula in a way that would have ensured that after next year there would have been no statutory, to reason, statutory reason to give additional increases in special education funding. So um, that, that was really important that that was defeated. That, that particular proposal also would have um, allowed the state to take credit for local option budget dollars and for special education and call that state aid for special education. So there were some really um, bad policy things in that bill. It was defeated. Um, they sent the proposal back to conference committee. A lot more work um, and legislative sausage making happened um, throughout the day on Friday and into Saturday morning. Um, they did not uh, end up running the budget on the floor, so it hasn't passed either house yet, but the proposal that is gonna be put out would give 75 million in new special education funding um, to schools next school year, and it can't, that money would come without um, the, the, the worst of those policy changes that had been proposed. Um, that's, a, that's a huge win because we've been advocating for several years um, around increasing special education funding in this state. Um, the governor had proposed about this much money in her budget as a down payment on a five-year plan to, in, to close the gap in special education funding. Um, you know, this is, this is a small step forward. The gap statewide is really about $423 million. Um, and, if, and if you kind of do the math, it really will still take five years of sustained putting $75 million more in each year to get us to where we close that gap. So, but there, there's reason for optimism there. In it, Can I ask a question about yes. that? So separate, different than the, um, I understood that the dollars we, we could potentially be getting now will be ongoing yes. comparative to the others, which was gonna be fi final, which you had, like it was a one-time right. contract. Um, right. Yes, yeah, so, so it's ongoing in the sense that once they put that $75 million in, they can't take it back because okay. of the requirements in the federal um, law about maintenance of effort. So it'll be $75 million more every year going forward. Um, the governor's plan, though, would have put in 75 million yet next year, and then an additional 75 the second year. So that would have been okay. 150, and then so adding. So that's what um, that's what we'll be looking to work on. Um, yes. You know, okay. and and uh, to continue that progress. In addition. Um, uh, relative, re related to issues in our district, they did change, um, they did pass the bill that is gonna change the, the student count that we use for funding. Um, it, instead of right now we can use a one year look back or a two year look back, that will become either current year enrollment or a one year look back, but next year only uh, districts will get to use an average of a two year and a one year look back. So there will be a slight uh, decrease related to that. Um, in our, in our funding because we're a declining enrollment district, but it, it will help districts like us transition to this new um, model where districts will only use current year or one year look back for enrollment funding. Um, and just a final note, I wanna say thank you to all the board members, um, staff, and community members who made your voices heard on these issues. Um, in the past several weeks in the Kansas legislature, I can tell you from being there in person um, that you were absolutely heard and it absolutely made a difference. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, now I'll make it quick. Um, <laughs> not a problem. Not a problem. Um, just want to let you know, I attended negotiations. Actually, we had two negotiations Thursday and then again on Monday, and then Tuesday, and Tuesday. Uh, and actually, I had been on the negotiation team, my first stand on the board. It is totally different. <laughs> <laughs> it's really totally different. Um, Okay, uh, in, attended Beyond the Board at Hillcrest, and actually it was a very dynamic meeting, uh, and I think really should continue next year. It, it, it is an excellent way to involve the communities. Um, see, um, also um, had a uh, announcement from from New York Elementary on Friday morning, 7.30 to 8 a.m. You can purchase a cup of coffee or hot chocolate. There? 
Yeah. Oh my God, I'm on that. Okay. <laughs> so here's Chef. Um, and he also attended the uh, uh, District Equity Council, and we we're discussing and looking at engagement. Um, my thing with it is, is I always separ separate out engagement to two things. There's community engagement and family involvement and family engagement. Uh, so as I'm looking to return our assignment, I'm trying to figure out how do I separate it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, other than that, that is it. Okay. Thanks, y'all. All right, we're going to move on to approval of consent agenda. Can I have a motion? I move we approve the items listed on the consent agenda. Second. Jones? Yes. Byers? Yes. Kimball? Yes. Kadu Blackwood? Yes. Costello? Yes. Franklin? Yes. Gordon Ross? Yes. Motion passes 7-0. Okay, so we're going to move on to the Liberty Memorial Central Middle School redesign update. Um, it looks like Patrick Kelly and Dr. Schmidt are joining us, along with Vice Principal uh, Mitchell and Sean Hansen, Director of Secondary Curriculum. Welcome, y'all. Okay. Good evening. Thank you for um, having us here. We are back for, I think, the fourth time in the past nine months. So we're, we're, there's a lot of continuing themes with a more specific angle um, about th those informational pieces that were specifically requested from the board. Um, primarily calendar, which leads to schedule, busing, and staffing, all of which are intertwined. And we have some slides to explain that. Um, this is kind of our our guiding statement that has been on that has been pre um, presented to both community members, parent meetings, site council meetings. We kind of are using this. One of the things that um, Kelly was so at the most recent site council meeting we had um, there, <laughs> thanks to Facebook and other maybe comments outside of the narrative that we can provide. There are some questions about maybe if we're a magnet school or things like that. So we produced a slide that we shared on our Facebook page as well as should be on the district website regarding some um, questions that have been, been presented to us from community members and how we can answer that, one of which, for example, are you doing away with ELA, things like that, the answer, which is no. I won't go through that, but it is a really, um, it, it's a very helpful document for potential parents that are interested, for anyone really. And as I look at the transfer requests um, that we can see thus far, it, it is a helpful guide for parents who might um, not understand exactly what next year will entail and what it will entail for their kids. So I would draw attention to that. Um, Phil here, um, I'll let you speak okay. to this. This is a, another repeat slide, but it kind of... Yeah, this is one that we've seen before as well, just kind of talking about uh, what the uh, teaching and learning requirements will be at Central next year. Um, this is part of that conversation of having an eight period day that includes student success, but also builds in um, a requirement for a STEAM class to be taken, a fine arts class, but also building in room for more choice and elective. So if a kid wanted to say, um, take two music classes, they'd have that opportunity as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we also wanted to stress the need um, to have that individual plan plus PLC time each day as our staff is being asked to take on new ways of teaching, uh, take on new teaching assignments. Uh, we really want them to be prepared and to feel prepared uh, to put out a good product every day. This is also, it just so happens to be the timing kind of aligned itself, but this is consistent with what the, to a, to a certain extent, consistent with the, um, what the MO resorting back to what former academic year was for the middle school schedule. The difference being that our student success block would be a little bit larger um, in that we are we are touting that as inquiry time, which we'll explain later. But I just want to point to um, that we are still providing those same elective opportunities. And when we say we are a STEAM curricular focused school, that's in addition to other curricular offerings, an extension to which not in replacement of. Um, this has been, we have been very vocal as both, um, you know, um, 
supporters of our students as well of our staff, as our staff members. And in order to take on that extracurricular block, well, I would say two to a large extent. We have that extra STEAM elective that we would like to offer to students, and we have that inquiry block time, which is going to take some outside of just the normal curricular model. It's going to take teachers that are dedicated to really bringing project-based learning opportunities, curriculum, um, teaming, all of those things. And as such, we know that that is going to take time. And we are, um, we are committed to allowing our professionals to get to um, have that professional time. So we are proposing the, the schedule that um, we have kind of mentioned, but today is kind of the final, I guess, the time frame of which would be 8 a.m. to 3.15 p.m. on every day but Wednesday. That would take, a, Wednesday would take us to 1 o'clock instead of 1.53, that's a, a shift. We would be going a bit later in the day to allow for um, that professional development. It would not decrease the um, con this total student hours. It would just reorganize them in a way that we think better fits our curricular, instructional, and student needs. Um, as such, you guys have probably been through those negotiation conversations that when you increase the denominator of a master schedule, you have the potential to increase class sizes, which I don't think anyone in our community really wants to do. So that becomes the FTE request of an additional 2.0 um, in, in getting to that, that teaching or that eight versus seven hours. And just one point on that with those four additional days, um, the focus of those days, um, as far as calculating uh, the calendar goes, is using that time for PLC and professional development. Uh, again, even if a teacher isn't taking on one of these new STEAM-directed courses, we're still asking them to shift the way that they deliver instruction. Yes. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we have time, kind of, you know, in addition to the, the days that are already in the calendar, uh, to develop, to grow, to collaborate mm -hmm. um, as, a, um, as a staff. We um, know that we, you know, it's our due diligence if we do have four days where our teachers are going to be engaging in pro professional learning to publish those dates for our community members early so we can um, talk about the, you know, so, so our families know how to prepare for that. And so these are the days that we have suggested. Um, it, it, it lies heavy on prior to spring break because that's when we believe a lot of learning will happen. We are asking for full day blocks for um, a, a myriad reason, but one of which is when we, um, the second to last presentation we had with you, we talk, spoke about our partnership with Project Lead the Way and some different national curricular producers. They don't do like two hours random PD. It's an eight hour block, especially if you are trying to license or certify yourself to, a, well, I don't, or if you're going to specialize in one of their curricular options, most of those um, are whole day events. So. Um, and being true, I mean, just be the sheer logistics of where we're headed kind of necessitates larger blocks than just maybe a one and a half hour on a Wednesday. And in response to uh, questions last time about uh, student instructional hours and contact, uh, these days are actually Wednesdays, and so they would minimize the loss of that contact. Yeah. We've kind of spoken through this. Um, at the end, you know, we are we are talking. I, I know. I'll say this: student success at the end of the day produces a lot of possibilities for community input for students visiting outside of the school. But it also presents. Um, we have to we have to have time and really um, come up with a solid idea of how that works. So it's a um, so it's a tightened up at the end of the daytime and space. So um, that's what our team is going to continue to work for, look at what that inquiry block truly means and allowing, um, you know, allowing our power standards and discussions around our power standards to be communicated out to all staff members to see how they could best integrate that into their class. And again, to try to um, minimize the ask of FTE when it comes to the, um, uh, the, the PLC block within the daily schedule. Um, student success uh, really serves as almost a block. Well, a block, it's double the, um, the time so that we could use, say, half of that for a plan period or a PLC block and mm -hmm. be consistent with those that might have plan or PLC uh, during hours one through seven. Um, 
And then the other aspect of that student success is we're still going to be doing everything that student success has been this year mm -hmm. with Character Strong, with intervention time. Uh, so we want to make sure that we have the time to do those things well, uh, but then have that additional time to add the inquiry block. And I will say that talking to staff about the potentials of, of what sort of inquiries could be developed, um, a lot of staff members are kind of excited and invigorated by the possibilities yeah. being able to tap into their own interest and expertise and kind of expand that curriculum, you know, as long as it's, it's aligned with uh, community involvement and student interest. Uh, but we've had some staff members uh, come to us about, hey, what do you think of this? So as long as those projects kind of fit that STEAM uh, inquiry rubric or curriculum, uh, we really want to try to be provide as many opportunities and options as we can. It was exciting. We had an interview today without giving away any HR violations, but a non-science teacher, and we, we touted the idea of, hey, we really want all of our teachers, whether they be in the fine arts department, whether they be in the world language department, to take on that inquiry block and make it, and to really collaborate with their colleagues, grade level colleagues. And this certain individual was like, well, I was going to major in my said major, because that would give it away, or science. So they were superbly excited about being able to branch outside their, you know, first to sixth hour subject matter so I, I do think um, that that is it, it's not it's we have staff members who are truly truly excited about that and um, I, I think our retention rate there are the yeah our retention rate speaks to that as well um, yeah that kind of there, we, we found that there's no cost, cost difference from that 8 a.m. start time 3 15 um, speaking of enrollment retention we are happy to report that our current projected enrollment is, is um, thereabouts of 400 students. That's slightly over what we have this year. I mean, it's a, so um, we are trying to, we're advocating for an FTE that will keep, will not add to our class sizes because what we're doing, um, you know, with this curricular addition, not necessarily a shift, but instructional shift to a certain degree, um, we, we certainly don't want to have an added burden of um, students having tons of classmates where it just becomes difficult, more difficult to manage. Okay, time for questions. All right, very well done. Others? So, go ahead. Um, how many transfer requests have you received so far? That is through a district database. Um, the last time I checked, it, we were less than 20, and the transfer in requests were ab over about 15. So I w it's, we're, um, we, we, we don't have a gross difference of any significant number thus far. Okay. Um, um, in regards to the four days that you're proposing off, um, I was just curious if um, since the district is technically open those days, if we would be able to provide lunch for those students um, who would normally get lunch at school somehow. <laughs> On those PD days? Yeah. Um, we probably can look into that. I can reach out to Julie to see, uh, Julie, Hen Julie Henry, yeah, to see if there are some go. offerings. But um, typically on those PD days, um, we don't provide it, but I'm not saying we couldn't in this instant. I just know since, I mean, the other schools are open, mm -hmm. that is yeah. different than like a typical PD day, so. Yeah, yeah we can look into that. No question, I just wanna thank you for bringing back the, all the answers to the questions we asked last time, yeah. and I'm really, uh, yeah. I'm really excited about where this has ended up, I know. Um, it's been an extraordinary amount of work for you and your staff, and um, it, it's, it's, I'm excited to see this Thank fly. You for that. It's, I feel that we're in a really great place of conversations um, with community members, with staff. It's, 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 been, it's been a lot of work, but it's been certainly worth it, so. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Just a minute, I think I saw Carol. Did you, were you gonna go? Well, oh, yeah, thank you. And I was about to ask your question about the, the transfer and the, the enrollment projections so far, so thank you. And, I just want to thank you for all of your work, and we can see your excitement and hear your excitement about from your, your, what your report from your staff, but um, one of the things that we worry about as board members is burnout, and so we are very happy that, that, that there's this great opportunity for our staff members to 
maybe look at options that maybe they you know, they were interested in, but maybe they're going to be stronger and yeah. expand their careers. So thank you. And yeah, and I, I do appreciate everyone's willingness to not um, expect this to all be a one and done by August because that would have, it, had that been the expectation, that would have only further contributed. So we've been intentional about being having a sequential rollout based upon what's feasible because I, otherwise it probably wouldn't be too plausible. And that is, again, one of the reasons why these kind of regular days within our calendar uh, we feel are very valuable. Mm -hmm. It's because it, it helps prep for that next quarter, um, helps fight off some of that burnout. Uh, because if we're adding more options uh, educationally, we're not taking things away, we're asking, with a staff that's about the same size, we're asking them to take on, more. to wear more hats, to mm -hmm. more preps, those sorts of things. Uh, so as they learn those new tricks and new courses, we feel like this is something that they're definitely going to mm -hmm. need. I definitely appreciate the thoughtful and measured um, rollout as well. Um, I think you guys have put a lot of thought into it because um, I initially was a little nervous that we were going to try to accomplish way more yeah. than was reasonable in a short amount of it time. It was the internet. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the more, you know, the more I hear about this, the more excited I get. And I just think it's yeah. going to really be awesome. So I'm excited for you guys. So I was, one, thank you for all that you've done. Uh, you know, it's been, it's been fun to watch the, the, the evolution as, as you've come and presented. And, you know, I'm just, I'm just curious, you know, as we, as we, as we kind of make, make make light of it a little bit i'm i'm curious as you've gone through this evolution have you have you found a, an actual tangible difference as you've interacted with members of the community as you as you've gone along this process in terms of their understanding of what's happening maybe has gotten better um they've they they have a better idea or is it still you all are still driving that ship one person at a time that's a good question. I think the uh, open house nights that we had um, right around parent-teacher conferences, uh, we're encouraging as far as the questions, the types of questions we got, the things that um, needed clarification mm -hmm. versus the things that didn't. Um, the second night of that event was really well attended, so that was exciting to see. Um, and then we are going to have a couple of informational nights in April and May. And so I hope that the questions continue to kind of drill down to now that we have some of the specifics we didn't mm -hmm. back in early March, uh, that we can provide more of those details as people make their decisions. Mm -hmm. Do you have the dates for those? April 16th is the first one. It's at 530. And May 15th is the second one. Yeah. May what? Just a minute, yeah. Geo, just a minute. Go ahead, Bob. Oh, and I just wanted to thank you. As I'm sitting here, I tend to be more of a systems guy, so I look for how things flow. And and I, for me, you've taken this from the idea to the reality, and you put meat on the bones. So things, so when people look at it, at it, they can understand what you're doing, why you're doing it, and how you're moving forward. Yeah. So I'd like to congratulate you on that work because. It's really a difficult thing to do to, to move through from idea to reality well, and have it well planned and thought out. We have a phenomenal staff of dedicated educators from counselors to social workers to, I mean, to teachers. To, we, it, it was a group effort. It really was. And sometimes it was, I wasn't even there because I was doing other things. So it really was our staff coming together and making this what we believe is going to best benefit our students. Well, good work. And I appreciate the board kind of hitting the accelerator at the last meeting. It's yeah, because we kind of needed some. Getting some momentum. Uh, it was a busy, I'm glad this meeting got pushed back a couple of days. I appreciate <laughs> that. Um, but it really did kind of. Solidified you know, some things. For it is. And uh, we got some great help from ELT in mm -hmm. making those things happen as well. So, Thank you all. GR, did you have one other thing? No, just no. Um, speaking of pushing back, that was a good plug, a good segue. segue. The deadline for submitting a 2024-25 transfer request has been extended through Friday, April 12th. <laughs> yes. Given that the next parent information night is the 16th, would we consider extending it for those transfers specifically to into? We, we had a conversation about that.
So do you mean I mean, there's there there there, Go ahead. Yes, anything's possible. I'm just concerned. <laughs> no, seriously, I'm just concerned about our counselors and yeah. them getting yeah. classes yeah. scheduled. I'm just saying, like, could we make it like yeah. the 17th or something? Like, just just for if they were looking at Liberty Memorial. Undecided. Yeah, well, just so, like, you know, I haven't been able to attend one of the, I mean, I've heard a lot, but I, have, I would like to go to the parent night and stuff like that before I make, and take my child before I make a decision. Mm -hmm. So. I will say why it's they not just about me. deliberate that. Just to make that clear. <laughs> yeah, outside our, of our hands, but we'll take anyone any time. So. Yes. <laughs> I will say why they deliberate on that, that um, most everything that we put together as far as materials, some of the videos that you've seen, including uh, the early March, I think the first night of the open house, um, is up on our website. Yeah, if you go to the central website and click on About, you'll see a, a tab for Steam, and that's kind of a place for all the information that we that we put together. So yeah, I just want to be considered of, of like, like I said, the counselors and HR in terms of, of staffing. I don't want to put anybody in a bind, but obviously this is new and we want to, uh, we want people to get excited about it and we definitely don't want to turn people around, but we have to be considered yeah, our, our staff reason, too. So I sure. think the answer is yes, we can. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. <laughs> with, uh, I appreciate that with the caveat of uh, we, may, we may need to go over and help out wherever we can. Yeah. Linda, do you have something? Yeah, I um, also want to thank you guys so much for the information. In between the last board meeting and the first day of enrollment, I think it was April 1st, my uh, grandson, which is at Billy Mills, actually, I had no idea, but he had been researching the school. And he uh -huh. asked me, could he attend? And so I told him, you know, asked him what was he interested in. It was a lot of things that he wanted to do. So we sat down and went through some information and Aww. his mom actually put in a transfer. So oh, he my goodness. That's great to hear. initiated, I want to go to this school nice. next Aww. year instead of going to Billy Mills. So I appreciate you guys. Uh, and, he, and he's watching now, so he's looking Aww. forward to looking at all <laughs> well, this stuff as well. So. <laughs> thank you. I or we'll see you in questions. August. <laughs> Christian. Christian, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. That's a true definition of a goal. We want all of our students to be the CEOs of their own learning, and he's Absolutely. really taking charge. And he's in sixth grade, so he was just that. like, I'm watching tonight. So I said, they'll be presenting tonight. He said, well, I'll be watching to see if I can get some more information, but I want to go there next year. Yeah. Well, one of the great things about the rollout, it being phased, is it allows us to also build upon student feedback mm -hmm. and interest mm -hmm. as we go. And so to regroup. Or yeah, and we're looking at you know building the first semester schedule and kind of pausing and seeing you know what is working where 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 the demand is and kind of being able to cater it that way as well yeah. Yeah. what what type of um i guess comments feedback excitement have you been hearing from your students i mean <laughs> they are well our sixth graders had a great time at the sea so i i don't we have very few transfers wanting to out of our sixth grade um students who just got to go to that steam academy and, and be part of it I just, you know, I mean, I think that they're excited to be at Central this year. I think we've done great work um, at large, and this is just an added bonus. So I, I don't know that they've done any, like, I'm going to be a STEAM 7, um, you know, YouTube or TikToks lately, but I do, I do feel that there's a growing, you know, I mean, one of our building goals was to grow our culture of learning and our commitment among staff, students, and community members, and I, I believe that we've done that at large. Yeah. Can just make me think of something does not that does not necessarily have to be TikTok, but <laughs> any type of student social media campaigning to recruit yeah. I think will be beneficial. we do have an electronic media yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay so the questions la there were questions last time about schedule so it seems like you you have direction on the schedule there's no dissent from the board so the next the next step would be maybe some conversations with uh lea and the negotiation teams about variants you might need yeah um i am hearing from the board uh also no challenges related to additional staffing which honestly we're probably going to come out in the wash when you looked at the yeah. um the um mou sunsetting mm -hmm. Josh Spradlin in the back is giving me the thumbs up because he's proud of me for paying attention at negotiations. <laughs> um, 
so the um, so those were kind of the areas in which there were maybe yeah, you just needed to hear like some direction from the board. And additionally, I didn't hear any concerns related to the additional four days from the board. That's also something we don't necessarily have to vote on, but it does sound like there's support, and that's good to know for you all. Um, happy to see that there's not additional cost with transportation. It supports your schedule. So I think you all are set. Right. to go whatever it is next. Um, Working as a team and crafting what next steps look like. So. Yeah, and the next big one for us is professional development. Yeah. Yeah, Helping okay. Helping teachers as soon as possible start those programs. Yep, okay. Ready, so. um, is my assumption around the FTE correct, that that is a pro maybe for, um, Christian Ryan, for those at home, is, is um, giving the thumbs up that that is correct. We would have had to add about that many to account for the MOU. So, um, yeah. you know, do good work. It looks amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's, you. I'm so proud of it, and I, I didn't have as much to do with it as I wish I did. So thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is... Um, really? Can we take a five-minute Yeah, break? I was just about to say that, actually. So thank you, Anne. <laughs> Um, next, we have safe and supportive schools and equity update, but we want to be completely present for that. So we're going to take a five-minute bio break and be right back at 8.32. Nope. I had a different time on my computer. We'll be back at um, 8.30. Let's go 8.35.
go. Okay. <laughs> let's go. Let's go. Look, I'm walking this way. We are going to move on to safe and supportive schools. I've never, I've, this is the first night I've used this. <laughs> Well, well, we we saw how effective it was. <laughs> so the next board I can see how red you are from all the way um, down here. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, Dr. Johnson, welcome. Thank you. Thank We're you ready. so much. Good evening to the board, and thank you for this opportunity to bring you an, an equity update. Um, this is looking primarily at our third quarter data. And let me begin tonight by saying that the data that we're sharing tonight, this is information that is in our power um, school information, student information system. Nothing has been drawn from any other um, sources. This is information that we have based upon what, what's in the system. And let me also state that equity does not belong to one person. It belongs to every department, every school, every classroom teacher, every administrator, every district leader, every custodian, every cafeteria worker, every single person in this district is a part of the work that we do um, regarding equity. So I'm saying all that to say that when you see different people in different spaces in different places, we are all working towards the same goal. Tonight, I want to bring you, bring to your attention again our focus of our strategic plan. We're looking at safe and supportive schools. We are the champions of um, the work that we do um, with equity. We're being joined tonight as well um, with Dr. Jana Craig Hare, who is our um, deck, her data. Um, just, she's so absolutely efficient in the work and things that she does. So we're so honored to have our director of data and assessment here that's also going to share information with, uh, with us and with you today. Um, our district goals um, always focus on reading, mathematics, and post-secondary success. And I said always. That means since we put in our new district goals, um, which was during the um, summer at the beginning of the school year. Just a reminder of our equity policy. I know you already know this because this is the work that we do every single year. Um, and each time we bring an equity report, I want to bring you, your attention down to the highlighted section that focuses on the superintendent or the designee. That's um, me as long as well as the other people behind me. Um, and we're focusing on the progress and the outcomes and how we are sharing this information at least quarterly, whether it's in a written format, a presentation format, which is why we're just looking at third quarter and things right now, as well as the broader Lawrence Public Schools community. Um, so it's shared with different groups um, about the work that we're doing um, as it centers around equity within our district. Tonight we have a total of four um, presenters. I am Cynthia Johnson, Executive Director of Inclusion Engagement. We also have Dr. Jana Craig Hare, who is the Director of Data and Assessment. We have David Favre here tonight, um, who is our Native American Student Service Coordinator. And we have Jennifer Georgie, our Lead Student and Family Support Facilitator. Tonight, I want to begin and set the stage for where we're going. We're looking at data. And there's one essential question that we're going to look at tonight. What does the data show about how we are doing? There are numbers on the screen that you're looking at right now. And as we go through these presentations and these different slides, I want you to keep in mind that every number that's um, on that screen that you will see here in just a few minutes represents a child. It represents a child that's like the children um, that are over on the right side of your screen, and it also represents your children, your grandchildren, your nieces, your nephews, your brothers, your sisters in this district. So I don't want us to ever get that separate. We're looking at numbers, but the numbers represent the children that have been entrusted into our care. So what does the data show about how we are doing? Tonight, we're going to kick it off with academics. There's a quote in the screen. It talks about you know, the games. It, we, we saw some very, very good games <coughs> last year. We, we showcased at the beginning of the school, school um, year different schools. And there were more schools that had really made some significant gains. But the, you will see that nationwide, that p schools are still working hard to reach the pre-pandemic achievement levels. So keeping that in mind, um, I'd like to turn this over to Dr. Jana Craig here, and she's going to bring you the assessment update for spring 2024. There you are. Thank you. 
So assessments are my world right now. So we are in the middle of state testing. Um, think good positive thoughts for our scholars as they finish up their assessments by April 19th. And then our virtual students can test through May 3rd virtually. So that's a new, new option this year. Um, right now, we're looking at the CAP predictive interim assessment. This is from our spring window. So that was January 29th through February 9th. The interim predictive is, we just started that two years ago, or last year. Um, this is a, an assessment that students take three times a year in ELA and math, and it is aligned to the state standards. We use it as a district common assessment, so it's a way that we can kind of do a dipstick and just check to see how are our students doing related to the state standards across all of our buildings, and then also compared to other students across the state. Um, it does help predict future performance on the state assessment. And one of the good things about this, one of the advantages is if students do all three of the tests, they are exposed to all of the content standards that they would see on the summative assess assessment that they're taking right now. And then the other advantage is it uses the same system that the state assessment uses. So there is not unfamiliar technology when they get ready to take the state assessment. That, that stress piece is, is not there, hopefully, um, just because they are familiar with the, the system and the tools and all the resources they, they have available. So when students take the predictive interim assessments, they receive a high score and a low score. So it's the, the high predictive, so on the best day, this is the score they might get on the assessment, and on the worst day, this is the score they might get on the assessment. So to bring this into one metric, then we just take an average of that high score and the low score, and then put that on the, you know, use that scale score against the cut scores per grade level, per content area, to say this is probably the level they're going to score. So that's the prediction piece of it. So this is showing our overall ELA and math, and really one of the areas that we focus on is at level one. So what are our percentages, our number of students, and our percentage of students in level one? And then how can we use this instructionally? And all of our schools have reports just like this that show the, the breakdown by levels and by, by grade level. Um, so how can we use this instructionally? So do we have students that are predicted to score in level one? And then what can we do in our classrooms that could impact that, that could hopefully get them to a level two? Or do we have students that are like right on the bubble? So they might just take a little bit more to bump them over to the next level. So then what are the, the specific standards that we can work on that could help bump them over to the next level? And then we've also broken this down by subgroup. So and again, our buildings have the same, same type of information. Um, within these subgroups, so we're using the same model, an average of the high score and the low score, and then looking at our level one students and really looking at the subgroups. And in this area, you know, the focus area I would say for ELA would be looking at any of those subgroups that are more than 30% of our students are predicted to be at a level, level one. So our free and reduced lunch students, our students with disabilities, the ELL students, students who identify as African American, or American Indian, multiracial, and Hispanic. So those would be the ones that we should really be pushing in on and, and focusing um, some extended efforts. The next one shows our math. And again, if we're looking at our level one, students that are predicted to score in a level one, you know, the concentration areas would be free and reduced lunch students, students with disabilities, and African American students. Over. Yes. I want to take just a moment to um, give you just a quick update on our academics current practice. This is not everything that is taking place, but I just wanted to give you a quick um, snapshot. I want to begin with the needs assessment. Um, um, Patrick Kelly shared this information um, with you um, last summer. It is a massive document, it's, it, whether it's online or whether it's in a printed form, that truly guides the work that we do from a district level as well as a building level. It includes our district goals. It gives you a snapshot of, of our, um, our data um, as a whole, as well as it gives you a snapshot of each individual building and their building goals. That particular document guides our work and that leads us to where we need to be um, academically. Um, tomorrow, um, just by chance, the teaching and learning team um, will have our retreat and we are 
preparing for our summer institute um, as it relates to the work that we will do in our preparation for our needs assessment for next school year. So not only for the district, but also for each individual school. Another part of um, the academics, I'm hitting the areas in the um, orange or gold rod, whatever color that is up there, um, our focus on literacy, math, and post-secondary success. If you, when you saw the um, subgroup data, especially in the area of um, ELA, you saw that there were multiple subgroups that had larger or, or um, higher than 30%. I believe that that is directly related to um, where students are in the area of reading. If a child has having struggles reading, it is hard when they get to a passage, a paragraph, or whatever they're trying to decode or decipher to be, to be able to give a response. I was a struggling reader, and I'm sharing that to say I understand that from those standardized tests, that pressure that comes, and sometimes it makes you want to give up, and you just start selecting um, answers. So, uh, you know, um, we're still looking at all of that, but I believe that literacy is a major part. But one of the good things that we're doing is the work that um, Denise Johnson is leading in the area of our letters training. It is so exciting to come through here, even last night, to see the groups of teachers that come in, those elementary teachers that are coming in and focusing on different strategies to ensure that we help um, students become and remain successful. Another part that I want to talk about just very quickly is the use of the closing the access opportunity and achievement gap framework. This is the framework that leads our equity work. I've had the great pleasure twice this year to work with equity teams from every school. And in that work, we center our work around this framework. It was revised a little bit from last school year that we shared, and we added those levels. You'll see, I'm going to, you know, right in the center, it says, what does the data show about how we are educating all students? And that comes from that question that I opened up with tonight. What, is, what does the data show about how we're doing overall? But how are we educating all students? And then as you go around, the, the um, diagram, you'll see that you look at the levels of our marginalized populations, especially in those levels of um, level one, but also looking at those levels, students in level two, because we want to move those students to levels three and four as it relates to achievement and attendance and behavior. And then what type of instructional strategies do we need to have in place to help every, each student and every student be successful? And then what type of social emotional components need to be incorporated. Not going to go into that too much because at our next board meeting, we're going to bring you an update on um, that work. But that is some of the work that we are doing. So if, as you look at um, responding to the data, you saw a lot of data. You've seen a lot of numbers. Remember, that represents each child, different children in our district. One of the things that I have to um, say that I believe that we need to acknowledge is that post-COVID unintended consequences has had impacts on learning. I know we keep moving, but we have to realize that there are things that have happened, not just to students, but into, to families and in our community. We have to accept that, we have to own that before we can continue moving forward. Um, another area um, that I wanna talk about is the cultivating relationships and trust. I know that in our ELT, we're looking at how to close the trust gap, because there is a gap. And that gap, in many ways, widened throughout the pandemic. That was an unintended consequence. So what type of strategies can we put back in place, or new strategies can we put in place to build those relationships and to restore that trust or to build a whole new level of, of trust? And then, um, Mr. Byer said that he had homework today, and you're right, <laughs> we do have homework. Uh, but one of the most important things that we can do is to connect with our parents and our caregivers and our families to improve educational outcomes. It doesn't make a difference if you're talking about attendance, if you're talking about um, standardized tests, if you're talking about behavior. If you want to see those outcomes change, involve your families, involve those caregivers. So that's where we are 
in responding to the data. So I'm going to ask the question again. What does the data show about how we are doing as it relates to behavior? Behavior has multiple categories. Attendance, chronic absenteeism, behavior, um, discipline, and restorative practices. And I want to bring this particular quote to your attention. Um, Dr. Clay Cook, who is the Chief Development Officer for Character Strong, he states that, you know, last year, Character Strong, they interviewed and they engaged with thousands of educators across the country. They identified two particular areas that they were grappling with. And unsurprisingly, chronic absenteeism and escalating student behaviors emerged as primary concerns. So as we look at our numbers and we look at our data, it's not just happening here in Lawrence Public Schools. It is happening throughout the nation. I, I just took this one clip for you from the New York Times. This came out last week. We talked about it at our Equity Advisory Council. And it talked about why school absences have exploded almost everywhere. Almost everywhere. And what types of things are different districts um, talking about? And what types of things are different districts doing to decrease that chronic absenteeism? It is a challenge. It is a struggle. It is real. It, we deal with it every single day. But we have hope because we're not going to give up. So now, right now I'm going to bring um, Jennifer Georgie. And she's going to talk to you about attendance. Hello. So um, let's take a look at this um, data. So at the end of third quarter, the cumulative attendance uh, was 90.71%. And then at the end of the quarter, the chronic absenteeism was 29.38%. I just want to remind everybody that in order to be chronic, it has to be less than um, 90% um, with that. So looking at the attendance by grade level, um, we have the elementary, middle, and high school. So just looking at the elementary, elementary students came in the first quarter at 94.2, and then by the end of the third quarter, little dip with 92.7%. Uh, um, same with middle school. They are currently uh, at the end of third quarter at 91.5%. And the high school um, starting the first end of first quarter at 90.7%, uh, and then big, bigger dip with the uh, third quarter at 87.5. So then taking that chronic absenteeism and really breaking it down um, with our students. So, um, in the green, these are students who are attending 95% or more, um, and we have 40.63% of students that do not have any attendance issues, and then the chronic absenteeism there at the 29.38%. And I think it's important to point out um, what's this data, the way that uh, schools use this as well, they can look at the um, chronic absenteeism and really identify those students who might need support in their building. Um, so this is a, a good way to break it down to see those students that need support. Uh, we also do it by grade level. And as you look at this, you might notice um, the highest, which is our fifth graders. Uh, we have 47% of fifth graders who do not have any attendance issues. Um, what probably then stands out in the opposite is um, our 12th graders are at 50% are chronic. Um, and that is um, a yearly trend with 12th graders. Uh, they tend to have a higher um, chronic absenteeism uh, rate. And I will give it back to you. Thank you, um, Jennifer. Next, we're going to look at um, our average daily attendance by race and ethnicity. If you look at the elementary, middle, and high school levels, you see the colors across the um, graph. Down at, um, below, you see the legend. If you look at the elementary levels, we're, every, everyone is above 90%. Um, it's a little bit lower as it relates to our middle level um, with our American Indian as well as our multiracial. 
um, students. Um, there are other categories as well as our African American students. And you see that the, the data it drops, drops even more, and Jennifer just said this, um, at our high school level, we look at our African American um, students, our American Indian um, students. We look at our Hispanic students, um, once again, at our average daily attendance by race and ethnicity. This next slide is giving us a glimpse of our data by um, race and ethnicity once again, but it relates to chronic absenteeism by subgroups. You will see that um, the top two subgroups, and I say the top two, when KISA, um, when KSDE came in last week and we did our first KISA check-in, one of the questions that they asked was, what are the two subgroups that are causing you know, the greatest concern as it relates to the data, not as individuals, but as it relates to the data. The two that I spoke about was um, our American Indian, Alaskan Native, but also our African American um, students. And the reason that I selected those two particular subgroups, not just because of the number, but also because there's an intersectionality, because some of those students also may, may be um, um, eligible for free and reduced lunches. They also may, may be students of disability. So those are the two that we've shared with um, KSDE. Um, tonight we have David Favre who is going to come talk to us. Um, he is our new, as of about a month now, um, American, um, he is our Native American um, Student Service Coordinator, and he's going to come talk to us about the American Indian, Alaska Native, um, and the 46% of chronic absenteeism. Alito Chamai, um, you know, all of these points listed out there, they're all interconnected. And so one of the methods that we're going to go after is we're going to use cultural activities to engage not only our students, but our families, because they want to trust us, they want their hopes to be fulfilled, and they need to know that it can happen at these schools in this community and not have to go somewhere else. So we're just gonna make every effort we can. We're gonna do all the studies we can this summer and surveys, and then next year is gonna to look totally different for this program than it has in the past. My turn. Um, so as David said, what he did was, um, what he was talking about was that family engagement piece. And that is um, one of the interventions that we are um, using this year and will continue to make that uh, bigger and better. So when we talk about the interventions on how are we going to improve attendance, it goes on the tier system. So the tier one would be those interventions for everyone. And we started the year off with a tier one intervention that I've highlighted here, and that was that September attendance awareness. And that was a lot of fun. I, I don't think our district has participated in that before, and that became really knowledgeable for parents to look at those facts about what happens when, um, when kids miss greater than 90%. Um, and it was just good information for students and got us in the right mindset to uh, that every day matters uh, for that. So tier two interventions that we are using and are seeing um, significant um, difference is the one-on-one -on -one conversation. So when a student falls in that chronic or trending chronic to try to get them before they get to be chronic, um, oh, sorry, we're having those um, conversations with parents um, and students and figuring out what those barriers are and talking with them about the barriers and what can we do to help um, you get your child to school. Thanks. Um, and this is probably a good time to give a shout out to the attendance secretaries. Um, they're really amazing. I see them each week and they are, they are probably the ones that are making those phone calls with the principals and talking with parents and making those relationships and connections so that parents can trust them and share what is really going on. Um, and they work really hard in making sure our attendance is accurate in power school. So, um, we're very appreciative of our attendance secretaries. Once again, I want to, um, to take a moment to 
give you some examples of how we're responding to the data. Once again, we have our numbers that represent different children, but how are we responding to the data? And the two, the three I wanted to highlight um, once again, you see the engagement, you see that theme, you've heard that theme. Um, I didn't put that in there just for you, uh, Mr. Byers, but you hear that theme because we know and understand. Like I said, we, we're looking at research from attendance works from safe and civil schools and every single spot we go to, every single research study we're looking at, that family engagement is being uh, mentioned. Another one that we are, are going to work with schools on as we enter into um, next year, we may select a school or two to um, kind of do a pilot, a pilot or so for a week or so, but engaging students and monitoring their own data. Oftentimes, students don't know what their attendance rate is. Sometimes they don't know what their grades are. And when, I, when we were talking about this, the first thing that came to my mind, I went all the way back to 2007. I was a middle school principal. And we came to visit Kansas City, Kansas public schools. And at that time, Dr. Jim Connell was doing his work first things first. And part of that work of building relationships and developing trust involves students being able to monitor their own data. You could go up to any student and say, can you share your, um, your data portfolio with me? They're like, sure. And they would open up and they would say, when algebra, you will see that I'm this far ahead or these are things I need to make up. And not that I'm saying that every single student has to have a portfolio, but students need to know the numbers. I heard that, I heard that message over spring break, know your numbers. And that's the message I want to bring to students, work with principals and work with educators on, and teachers and staff members, know our numbers. Sometimes students don't really, I've missed 10 days. I've missed 15 days, may, they may not know, but they're adding up. I think that is very, very important. And also incorporating the resources from attendance works in safe and civil schools, that is um, uh, in conjunction with our um, Stronger Connections grant, we're going to be able to provide um, resources, some absolutely um, phenomenal resources that Safe and Civil Schools um, um, offers to us, as well as some different coaching sessions and things. So we'll talk more about that a little bit later on. So let's look at behavior and discipline um, by each level. Is that me or you? Okay, <laughs> I just want to make sure before I start talking. As you look at um, our numbers across, and you can look at first quarter, second quarter, um, third quarter at the elementary level, third quarter, there were a total of 154 um, events that involved 98 students. At the middle level, you'll see that um, third quarter, um, we had 392 events with 198 students. And if you will look at elementary, that from second quarter to um, third quarter, it decreased also at that middle level. Um, and you can see that second quarter, I'm not gonna play like I don't see it up there. Second quarter was a challenge, and especially at that middle level. And if you look at a middle, uh, middle school, 392 events and 198 students. And if you look at the steady decrease that is taking place at that high school level, um, kicking off with the first quarter at 274, then it went to 242, and now we're at third quarter, we're at, um, at the end of third quarter at 149. Um, so it's exciting to see at that secondary level how, what changes and things that are taking place um, within, within our um, district. Our next um, slides that I t I'm sharing with you and I, it was one entire um, table and I separated it so you would be able to see all of the numbers here. And we're looking at the elementary um, level by subgroup. I'm going to draw your attention to the colors, if you will. So let's begin, and you can look at the um, colors, um, the, the color of green. That means that we're going in the right direction. Um, as it relates to female students, I'm not going to go through every single one, but as we look at the, um, once again, at the, um, go all the way down to the bottom, I mean, we look at our white students, 23.33% um, um, 
again, heading in the right direction. And then we look at a, a direction where we don't want to go. If we look at our students, of disability, students with disabilities and our African American students, as well as our multiracial students, once again, we see that trend at that elementary level. Because we talked about this last school year, that trend at that elementary level where students of color, students with disabilities are receiving um, more consequences than other subgroups. That's at the elementary level. The middle school level, once again, I'm going to draw your attention to the different um, colors. The green um, is, d is demonstrating and showing that we're going in, in the direction where we want to go. We want to see that decrease. And you can see that decrease at that middle level. Um, shout out to the middle level, um, with the work that you're doing. Um, I know it's challenging and hard at all levels, but we know that our, historically our middle level numbers as it relates to behavior have been higher. Um, we look at the, our, our males, we look at our free and reduced lunches, as well as African American, um, American Indian, Alaska Native, as well as multiracial and Hispanic. So even though it's not the great big gains that we want to see, we are moving in the right direction, and I think that's very important um, to note. At the high school levels, um, our um, males were heading in the right direction, our free and reduced lunches, our African American students, um, and that's exciting to be able to see at that high school level, because remember, we just saw the elementary level, and my thought was, okay, what's happening at the elementary level? What types of things um, are people identifying that is leading to the point where we have to go to a consequence? So as we go into next school year, I've already, I've already had a discussion. Dr. Irvin, I don't know if you're watching, but I'm going to go ahead and say your name. I've already had a talk with Dr. Irvin as we looked at, that, I know he's the second, secondary director of schools, but all also looking at what does it look like to sound and sounds like to effectively educate um, African American males? What does it effectively look like to, to educate African American females? So as well as other subgroups, what are, what are things that we need to know that we may not know at this particular time? So this once again is our data um, by subgroup for each level. Our in and out of school suspension, Jennifer Georgie is going to come and talk about that. So um, with this, looking at the elementary, uh, middle school, and high school, especially comparing them to first quarter, second quarter, and um, third quarter, you can definitely see the middle school um, that Dr. Johnson was talking about um, with in-school suspensions and out-of-school suspensions. As an educator that spent most of her time in middle school, second quarter is definitely um, a tough quarter with uh, behavior with that. But uh, we are seeing um, less, which is great. Uh, third quarter, that is uh, the goal, is to definitely have students um, in school and not out of school. So with these incidences, we um, have tracked um, the restorative practices. So we've had 695 behavior entries. So I'm going to um, take a look at that first uh, chart there where it says restorative practices prior to behavior entry. And so this chart really represents the staff or most likely the teacher that has put the entry into power school. And so third quarter, um, 695, but 170 of those, uh, around 24.5% of those uh, that staff member used uh, restorative questioning. So when they put the incident in power school, there's an area where they can identify that, yes, they use restorative questioning. Um, this is something that did not happen five years ago. You know, taking the time to really talk with the student, like what happened, um, giving them their voice, um, not just jumping to conclusions, and that mindset takes time. Uh, with with teachers to take a look at the restorative questions and really look at the incident. Um, they may not get through all the questions because of the incident. Maybe the student is um, anxious or doesn't want to talk, but at least they're starting it and they are um, asking, you know, what happened? How are you impacted? What do you think needs to happen to make it right? So that's, that's what it means for the prior uh, to behavior entry. And then the second chart, this is more of that tier two. This is done by the principal or somebody on the restorative team that has had that training in tier two. So um, 
of the 695, third quarter 572 were used with restorative. And that, that's a lot. These are entries. These are, do not necessarily mean students. Um, very rarely is an incident just involve one student. So when you do restorative work, you're going to be working with that student and then the one that was harmed or um, maybe it was even a, a teacher that you have to talk with. So I really commend the administrators and the restorative team taking that time um, and going through that, that tier two process um, because the goal is really about repairing the harm if, if um, harm needs to be uh, repaired but, or changing the behavior. Yes, we want to lessen our out of school suspension and in school suspension, but the ultimate goal is to change behavior um, using that restorative work with that. So what is our current practice with uh, restorative behavior? Lots, <laughs> there's um, lots of stuff that I'm, I'm really proud of. We, we still um, have a ways to go and we, we still need to do a lot more work with restorative. I've highlighted the one that um, it really stands out to me. On um, February 19th, the elementary teachers had their professional development day. And um, most elementary teachers have been trained um, in the tier one. But I had over 80 elementary teachers um, choose to attend the restorative practice in the classroom. And um, their feedback was positive. Um, about how they can incorporate, easily incorporate um, the restorative components to their morning circle that they are already doing. They've already been doing um, community circles in their classroom. We're just adding a few of the components like the talking piece, um, but uh, very, very proud that I had, that we had over um, 80, um, which is great. Our next steps um, in responding to the behavior includes, um, first of all, um, the tier one. Next school year, um, team, IB, team IEB and student support facilitators are taking over all of our tier one training. No longer will we have to um, consult with, um, Kip, we're still, they're still our partners, but we won't have to pay for someone else to come in, come in to facilitate our training. Um, we're going to be able to take those philosophy pieces and then instead of just having a generic training, we're going to be able to help people look exactly at what we want and what we want to see put in place within our districts. We're very, very excited about that. Um, another piece of our restorative behavior work is our development of our elementary restorative and behavior matrix. This has been um, talked about for about a year and a half, almost two years, um, among um, elementary administrators. Um, this is something that has been asked for. We're beginning that work. Um, it involves um, Jackie Mickle, um, who is our lead elementary principal. It, in, um, it in, involves um, our new um, elementary director of elementary schools. Um, it involves Dr. Bill DeWitt, um, J.C. Roberson, and then um, Dr. Bill DeWitt from our secondary because we, we want to do that same type of alignment. We don't want to have one document let this way and then a whole, a whole another document that looks completely different. So we're really excited about that work. And then making sure that our new staff that's coming in, that we are ensuring that they know and understand and receive training on the tier two and tier three. So in that level, next year we are going to consult and work with KIPP Core, but after next year, we're taking over tier two and tier three. So it becomes our work. We're utilizing works for not only from um, KIPP Core, but also from other national um, programs. I don't have this on the screen, but I want to be able to say this. As part of our Stronger Connections grant, we are going to be able to take a team to the National Restorative Justice Conference this summer to be able to sit in the same place, in same space, with school districts from all over the United States. I mean, I have my list. Like, I, wanna go, I wanna go see Oakland, California. I wanna go see this one, but they'll be there. 
talking about restorative justice, not just in schools, but also in the greater community, how they grew it outside of the four walls of the school. So we're very, very um, excited about that. I'm also going to ask Jennifer Georgie to come up here, stand next to me just for a second. She doesn't even know I'm going to do this. Um, a couple weeks ago, Jennifer received an outstanding invitation, and um, we're going to support her in this work. Jennifer has, asked, has been asked to serve as um, a trainer um, through um, KIPP Corps. Um, she's done a little bit in the past couple years or so um, when she was at West, but we're really excited about that. We're working out and finalizing all the details, but we're excited about the work that she is passionate about, that she can talk about, all day, all night, to be able to make a difference in the lives of children. So we want you to, to know tonight that we are honored that now here in Lawrence Public Schools, we will have an individual that works with that KIPP Corps team. It will not interfere with the work that she already does, but it will support all that we do within this district. So I'm gonna give you a round of applause for that. Thank you. Stronger Connections Grant, we're excited, very, very excited to bring Christine um, Caffey um, from um, Hillcrest. I'm sorry, Sarah Cruz, that I had to steal her. Um, but we're very excited that she's coming to be one of our behavior support um, specialist facilitator. I have the wrong word up there. It should be facilitator. Um, no, it is behavior support specialist. Thank you. Let me get it, let me get it um, straight in my mind here. Um, and um, Christine will work with elementary schools. And then we will have Emily Ross, who is coming, from, coming to us from the Manhattan School District. She's very, very excited about coming here. She brings, both of them bring a wealth of knowledge to be able to help us move forward as it relates to chronic absenteeism, classroom management behavior. I had to put this um, disclosure on the um, screen that this position is not assigned to a particular building. I've already been asked that question. Um, can, I, can I have this person be housed in my building? That's not what that role is. That role is to be able to help schools at the elementary and secondary um, level. I'm very excited about um, what will take place at the end of this month um, as it relates to our equity work. Um, and I very explicitly in our equity policy identifies those students that, that um, may identify as LGBTQ plus and being able to offer services and resources to our educators so that, as well as to our families and to our parents so we can ensure that we're all moving in the right direction. So at the end of this month, April 30th and May 1st, we are going to um, have um, our professional development from our national office from um, GLSEN. So we're very, very excited. Um, there will be invitations going out. We'll start getting um, our registration. I literally finished de details at about 4.40 eight um, today. Um, so getting, you know, finding time and finding space to be able to bring um, these team members in is very, very important. Another um, area as it relates to GLSEN and as it relates to LGBTQ plus is an area that I appreciate you, um, Carol Cadu, bringing the Blackwood, bringing this to my attention. Had never heard of this area, but we're finding out more information. I have it written down so I can make sure I'm saying it correctly. This is an area as it relates to, like I said, um, GLSEN and the work that GLSEN does, but from a completely different um, perspective. And this is called Two Spirit. Correct. Two Spirit. And um, the organization that um, Carol shared with me is, is entitled The Past Remembered, and it's a project that centers on the two spirits and the LGBTQ plus community. It strengthens um, its it strengths, its re, um, resiliencies, and the histories um, is our movement toward healthy equity. So we're going to be finding out more um, information um, about um, Two Spirits. Um, I know, Carol, you shared that at the end of May, I believe, um, Two Spirits organization is coming into the um, Haskell University. Correct. And they will be, um, they are in contact. Jericho Cummings, Cummings from the Past Remembered Project is working with the students at the Haskell for the Allies of Equality Club and the Haskell president, Dr. Arpan, to make arrangements to come in to talk to the administration and students. Excellent. And so they Thank want you. to come in and visit Lawrence Public Schools to improve the work that we're doing. Okay. 
Excellent. Thank you so much. I appreciate all the information. Um, and uh, so I will continue working with Dr. Lewis as well as ELT as we learn more about it as a team. Thank you. So the last question, what is the data show about how we are doing? Tonight we've revealed for you our glows, and there are many glows. We talked about our grows because there are definitely areas where we need to continue to improve and expand. We talked about our challenges. There are some challenges that we face every single day that we, um, we, uh, we know and understand and we want to improve. And then we also talked about our opportunities as it relates to our students, our families, our faculty, and our staff in Lawrence Public Schools. At this time, we'll entertain any questions you may have. Thank you all very much. Um, so we'll start uh, uh, maybe down. Who Can I just see who has questions to go? Ann does, Bob does, Kale does, okay. GR you do, or? Yeah, I'll wait for a little bit. Okay. Uh, well, maybe we'll start this way then. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, well, I had a number of uh, one first around um, around our 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 first subject, just around education. Um, yeah, I know we have a lot of our staff looking at reading, um, and as we're talking about achievement, um, I know most of the reading stuff is around um, early education. My question is, um, are we doing anything for students who have, who may be in middle school, have reading problems, reading issues? Are we doing anything to help catch them up? Because as they move on, that affects their future performance. Patrick, can I ask you to come just for a moment? Yeah, the answer to that is yes, but I'll let you, I'll let him expound a yeah. little bit more. Okay. <laughs> We're finalizing details is why I haven't shared all of it. Yeah. Bob, can you repeat your question? Well, it, it, my, uh, well, essentially it is, we're, we have our, our elementary educators looking at new theories around reading and uh, new processes. Um, that, as I grew up, I had reading issues. And the problem is, as you grow up and you move on in your education, those still exist. And I'm wondering if the new, the new theories, are we giving our older students the opportunity to, to use those theories or learn them? Probably not as much as we should. The new law requires us to screen every student for dyslexia, and so we do a screener for every student pre-K through 12 um, to see what their reading levels are. We've done quite a bit of work at the elementary level. We have more work to do at the high school level when it comes to the science of reading, which I think is what you're, what right. you're talking yeah. about. Um, you know, I think as we look ahead to KISA 2.0 is what they're calling it. One of the four fundamentals is that l literacy. And so we're going to need to elevate and really expect higher levels of, of reading instruction, um, especially at the secondary level. should have gone before board. board to question. Thank you, Beth, but that's up to you. Yeah. Okay, just wanna make sure. Should we maybe continue, like, focus on the section at a time and maybe? Right. I, I think, yeah. um, anyway, so we, uh, Bob, do you have additional questions? You said you had others? No. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's, that's fine. Okay, no, I'm sure. Someone, yeah. Okay. Uh, my um, my input is on the first section on the um, assess the interim interim assessment scores. Okay. So um, so one of the things that I have been hearing a lot about relates to the the goals that are being set for us around um, assessment scores, um, particularly as it relates to this conversation around literacy and um, the uh, there's some new legislation that's gonna create a literacy blueprint for the state. Um, and in that conversation uh, with the legislature, they are gonna be asking um, 
looking at our performance in that area over the next um, 10 years, nine years, um, with some goals in mind for performance on those state assessments. 50% um, of kids in levels three or four, 90% in levels two or above by 2033. So um, while I think we can need to continue to set our own goals for our students in our district locally, I think it's helpful for me at least to frame looking at this through those conversations. Um, and there's a couple things I noticed in our data that I have questions about. So I just wanted to point them out. And we don't have, you don't have to answer them tonight, but I, I would like to have some further conversation if the board is interested um, with, um, and Dr. Lewis. Um, in looking at our data with those metrics in mind, um, it seems like the areas that we are particularly needing to focus on are um, middle, particularly middle school, um, ELA, all three grades, and then eighth grade math. Um, those are the areas where I, I see the highest levels of kids overall in level one. Um, and if the idea is that eventually we only need to have about 10% of our kids in level one, or 10% or less um, going forward, you know, those are the areas that we have a lot of work to do. So I am curious as to, I know that assessment scores typically dip in middle school mm -hmm. across the country. That is a trend. Um, but I'm curious to have some further discussion about what particularly we are going to do in Lawrence Public Schools at the middle school level um, to, to, to really make some improvement in that area. So um, I appreciate the data. Um, I do uh, um, also wonder about whether the middle school behavior data that we saw, um, how much <laughs> how much those two things are traveling together, the achievement, mm -hmm. the performance on those interim assessments, and the behavior challenges that we're having. So um, I just wanted, I don't really have a question. I just, that was an observation, and I'm... And a request for a report. And a request for some additional conversation okay. in the future. Um, so Anne had made a good observation that might be helpful to stay on sections as we go through questions. So are there qu additional questions on section one? Go ahead, Anne. I do. Um, so I was looking at the um, some of the other um, reports, the equity update for third quarter that were also attached in the agenda. And they were talking about um, district goals of 75% students um, in kindergarten through 10 will score as at um, low risk or on track in the fast bridge. And I'm just trying to understand how does that correlate to state assessment performance, like um, as far as like at risk, or sorry, low risk, is that like in the two, three category? Um, it, what is on grade level considered? Um, is that a two on the state assessments? <laughs> Yeah, so and Jana's coming up too. So a fast bridge assesses skills, whether it's reading skills or math skills or what I refer to as academic interferences, those things that impact students from mastering uh, or achieving um, proficiency on the state assessment. So for example, a fast bridge reading assessment may give teachers information that says, okay, Ann needs to work on fluency or um, consonant blending because if until Anne corrects those, it's gonna be difficult for Anne to read this passage, passage and identify the author's purpose, which is what the state assessment assesses. So the state assessment assesses how well we're teaching the actual standards, and this fast bridge um, gives us, gives teachers information in terms of what are the skill sets that students are maybe lacking that may prevent them from being successful. So they don't align, but they, they help inform the other. Jenna? Yeah, exactly what you said. <laughs> um, so FastBridge is your norm reference test, so it is looking at those foundational skills and more specifically in reading and the, the skills that it takes to be a fluent reader. And then our state assessment is a criterion reference, so it's really looking at the state assessment or the state standards, and the state standards are ELA. So those include reading, but also writing and some other things too. So that's why when we looked at setting our goals for the district, we said the fast bridge was probably a better measure to look at foundational skills. And if we have those foundational skills, then it should impact state assessment scores. So just looking at those two things okay, kind of so in, in tandem together. Okay, th I appreciate that clarification. Um, but in looking then at state assessment scores, is two considered 
at grade level or is three considered at grade level? So two is still at grade level. So it's a basic understanding of grade level standards. So the, the I've sat through several presentations on this in the last <laughs> three months. Um, the State Board of Education does not use the term grade level in relation to the state assessments. Um, they're, if you read the descriptions of their categories, they're talking about a level two student has a basic ability to be to continue on and be prepared for college and career at graduation. Um, level three is, they use basic something, 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 something. So there's a lot of debate and misunderstanding about what the state assessment is actually measuring because oh, it's not, agree. it's definitely not, if you score a level two, you, you're on grade level. Like they, yeah. the this testing people from the state um, but they, but they also Actually say trying to accomplish with this. Though. Yeah, they also say that grade level or level two, three, and four. When you look at the data, students who score it in in the upper half of level two go on um, to have high levels of, of graduation rates and post secondary persistence. So it's a lot. It's a really nuanced conversation, um, and. So some, I think it's really sometimes hard to understand exactly what those tests are telling us, I guess is what I would say. Yeah, I mean, I did a deep dive um, a year or so ago looking at it, thinking, you know, because we all talk about wanting to have as many students as three, level three or four as possible, and then looking at results of different school districts. And when you look at, you know, like even like a Blue Valley, which, you know, had the highest scores in the state, they still were maybe at at best 60% in those. So I, that's, and this is really a conversation for anyone that has accountability in this room, but I just wonder what we actually think those, that they, they think they're actually testing and what information they're getting from that. Because it seems to me if that's where we want students to be, but even our best school district has 40% of the students lying below that then are we testing the right things? How accurately are we measuring things? So it's more of a and, statement you know, on frustration with the tests in general. But the, the interesting thing they have done in the parent information they provide for this Kansas assessments, they've done a crosswalk of the levels and the predicted score for students on the ACT. Levels three and four, if you're scoring a level three, your predicted ACT score in, in reading is somewhere between a 23 to a 30, and in math, a 23 to a 29. So that's um, level two, 18 to 22, 16 to 23, depending on if you're talking about reading or math. So um, you know, a level three and four is a pretty high, um, those are high achieving students. Yeah. And historically, we've always outperform the state. And so if we look at levels two, three, and four, we're at around maybe 70% of our students that are on grade level, if we, if we consider that on grade level and, and above. Really, this comes from the federal government. The federal government re requires four or five. Some states have five different um, levels. We have four. And the federal government requires states to define proficiency or um, those two levels Define proficiency losing, using two levels. Some states use below basic, basic, proficient, or advanced. We use levels one, two, three, and four. Uh, level one is uh, basic understanding. No, it's not. It's limited understanding. Level two is basic understanding. Three is effective understanding, and four is excellent um, understanding. And so that that comes down from the from the federal government. Um, I'm actually going to a group of leaders are going to uh, from Missouri and Kansas are going to uh, Washington next month. And we're going to lobby and talk to some people about this. Not that we can get it changed, but it does require um, a lot of work on school districts, and it doesn't accurately paint a picture of how um, how our kids are doing, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yes, Patrick. Or and part of the conversation too is that this is the last year for this state assessment as we know it. So the conversations right now are we're building a new state assessment for next year that are and new interims and everything that will be in effect for next year. So as we move into that, the talk I've heard is that we will still have four levels, so that part doesn't seem to be changing, but once we do the state assessment and then next summer they will have like a, 
it's a cut score meeting. So they'll look at where the level should be drawn. So um, level one should be a cut score between these two numbers or these two ranges. So they look at where most of the, the questions come in. It's a big standard setting um, conversation where they're looking at all the scores and then determining what those levels are for all the future tests based on what happens next year. Trying to create the levels off of a bell curve or something? Um, You're saying? They look for more like natural breaks in the scores. Shouldn't so they not like a, a one or two, but maybe there's a 10 point difference between somewhere. And so that, okay, that's probably a natural cliff where, okay, these should be level one and then the next and part would be a level be two. Like easier than that to know, like if you only have like 25% of the questions right, you're probably at a limit. You know what I mean? Like I don't understand why you would look at the scores to create the scale. Because they don't have the responses to those. They don't have a, a big enough um, data set that says this is how students are going to, to respond. Some of the items, they have been testing the items each year. So in our students this year taking the assessment have some of the um, items that are being tested for the new assessment. So once they have kind of a validity and reliability on the items and those go into the test, but then they'll want to do that further test of having all students take those items and now see where all students fall on those before they determine exactly where the different levels are. That still seems backwards to me. Oh, but. We're going to... Um, they, we, we're going to be searching for volunteers. So if you'd be like part of that, if you'd like to be part of that process, it's usually at KU, <laughs> and they'll have teams that come in with educators that kind of go through that whole process. And they I would actually be that. interested in that. So yeah. uh, mark your calendar. We're going to um, <laughs> move the conversation on here so that we can make sure that we get to some of those other problem. questions we have. Um, so we were on on questions related to the uh, the first part of the presentation as it relates to assessments. Um, are there other other questions on this on this section? Okay, um, and we have a request for additional data, um, which will come at a future board meeting. Uh, moving then into conversations around behaviors. Questions in this area? Um, it just I think. Did you have a question? Just start down there and come this way. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I'll say for me, looking at this data, one of the things that would be helpful for me to look at so that I can understand and be um, more responsive to the equity policy as it's written, I, I believe what I'm looking at, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it, it shows us the, um, what happened in the first quarter, the second quarter, the third quarter of this year, but for me to be able to understand our progress, I need to see where we were at last year um, comparative to this year. And that is what I'm asking to see. That is um, part of our fourth quarter. That's fourth quarter, you might have said that. I apologize. I, I did not say that, but okay. that is, we, we discussed that actually yesterday in um, ELT. That is part of our um, comprehensive um, equity report. We'll look at all of last year. If you go back and even look at fourth okay. quarter, from last year, it is it's cumulative of the entire so school what year. What you're doing now is waiting until the year is over, which makes perfect sense. Thank you for explaining that. I appreciate that. So, is fourth quarter is a good timeline? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, okay. that makes perfect sense. Thanks for clearing that up for me. Um, and then the other the uh, other question I had, um, we did have a comment um, come up around how we record. Um, behavioral events and the challenges folks might be having in recording those based on the shift now to restorative practices. I presume um, over the years of looking at the behavioral data, we've seen challenges in that area. Um, you know, that it's a hard, um, hard thing to capture for a lot of reasons, like when the incident's happening, the recording that has to happen, but also just how you how do you categorize? Sometimes it's subjective. But is it fair to say that um, we can look at last year's data to this year's data? We might have had the same challenges collecting that information, but it is still informative of where we might have successes, where we might have challenges. Is, yeah. can you, do you yeah. mind? Yeah. yeah, certainly. We can look at, and probably last year is probably the year that we, it's like our baseline year. Mm -hmm. And so we definitely can look at last year and compare it to this year. But again, um, we, we don't. It's not an end-all, be-all. Right. It's just one data point to start a conversation because we do recognize that sometimes uh, it, it varies in terms of what's entered at schools and then sometimes just teacher workload. I'm, I may not be able to get this referral in. So okay. we do acknowledge that as well. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. And I think it's also important to add, Dr. that Dr. Lewis, the, the um, quantitative data 
is looking at the numbers. That's why that restorative piece is so absolutely important because you have that qualitative mm -hmm. um, component as well. And I, I'm sitting here thinking this is my fifth year. This is the, only the second year that we've had the same entering system okay. for inputting data. So the baseline really from last year will will be a good comparative point, unlike, for example, we're talking about changes in the state assessment right. Right? Mm -hmm. oh, from last year to next year. Okay, thank you. Um, behavior question, go ahead. I have a question. Well, so. Carol, did you, wait, uh, not sorry. so much a question, but an observation. Mm -hmm. I, I'm looking at the chronic absenteeism, absenteeism, gosh, sorry, it's getting late. Uh, let's see, I'm looking at specifically at slide 21. I don't have the numbers up here. You, can, can you look above? Is, is that that one? Is it that one? Yes, yeah, that one. That one. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, yeah, it says forty-six percent for the American Indian or Alaska Native population. I know. Just remembering last year, it's just this is just two percent, like less than this time last year. I mean, it, it is moving the needle, but according to the the USD four hundred and ninety website, there are five hundred and thirty Native American students. So it's a, it's a small population, but a high number. So I just want to know if you have any observations or what's going on or how can we get these kids into the seats? Because as Patrick Kelly has said, our students don't, they can't learn if they're not in the chair. Yeah. I'm going to have um, David come because I know that he has looked at some of those observations. Right. And Thanks. our goal is, and one of our goals is, is not just to have them, we don't want them just to, to sit there. Right, right, right. We want, we want that engagement level, which that level of belongingness is so important. Right. David has looked at this data. We've already had conversations about that. So technically we're looking at 849 students that check the box that say, oh, okay. I'm Alaska Native American Indian of Heritage, and only 500 that have actually done the NAS paperwork. But what I've seen in the data and talking with the students is there's no push to get them to school. And so every little thing that says, well, the bus was running late, or, well, you obviously weren't there when the bus was running late. So it's getting the parents re-engaged because there's a lack of trust in our community. Mm -hmm. And that's part of this whole process over the next year is just re-engaging the parents and the students at the same time to get them to trust us enough to do the right thing by them. And so I haven't really been given a good reason why so-and-so hasn't gone to school. It's just why I didn't go. Uh -huh. My parents didn't make me go. So why? That's the question. Great, thanks. And, and Jennifer Georgie, she can, she, she will, I'm going to pull you in here, Jennifer, but you and I both took a part in the, the White Bisons, the, the grief training, if you will, and we did discuss the historical trauma impacts on our indigenous population, so that may or may not play a factor into the distrust in, of the education, educational system. I'm just I'm trying to guess here. Well, one of the things David and I um, talked about was um, like the video that we saw, right? Um, just educating um, our staff and teachers about um, the history of schools um, and trying to rebuild that trust, as David um, had said. So, um, just think we need to look into bringing that in. Oh, thank you. I want to also just add a note um, that we did not say earlier. Thank you, Kylie, for reminding me of this. We will have um, a master level um, social work intern um, that will work just with our NAS um, departments. So we're very, very excited to be able to have an intern with that laser-like focus. Super. Thank you, Carol, when we look at um, Native American chronic absenteeism rate nationally, pre-pandemic it was around 30, 31 percent. Mm -hmm. Post pandemic, it jumped to 54% right. nationally. And so ours is, well, rather still high, it's below national, but it's, it's so, something that we need to dig a little bit more deeper into, probably to get to down to some street data uh, to really uh, have, just have some conversations. <laughs> no, we were, we did a, um, an article that talked about numbers are one thing, but then going out into the communities, talking to students, talking to families to identify those barriers right. um, as to, you know, why our students are not coming to school. They ask what's going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and you could, I can see the social work student being really ready to do that. Um, so I don't know if that's part of what they're, I don't know if that's part of the plan, but that would, 
I mean, you, you would know better than me, but that's an appropriate role and I think hopefully it will have an impact so along with other things you're doing yeah. we're, we're gonna go at it in every different direction yeah. and I'm more than willing to do cultural humility for our own staff so mm -hmm. that we have a broader understanding of what it means for our indigenous communities because mm -hmm. honestly most of the kids here aren't permanent residents here they're moved here for a reason and hopefully they'll stay and that's part of that trust issue it also, Carol, reminds me, and, and for you as well, some of the conversations you had around um, curriculum changes that we might see and the work that, that you and others were doing in that realm as well, and that probably speaks to not only some of the cultural humility training you're doing, but also like what is a broader understanding um, that we could bring to the district. So I don't, that, oh, no, that's, th yeah, that also seems like a... Yeah, and that's exactly, um, in Deb Holland's report, boarding school report, that was one of her recommendations is, her recommendation was including education about boarding school trauma and history. Mm -hmm. And that could be something that would be, a, that would be the first recommendation that I would recommend. Mm -hmm. We're also doing that um, education for our students on, um, I can't remember what date it is, at the end of April, we are taking a cult cultural tour. We are starting at Haskell. Right. And from Has Haskell, we're going to Spencer Museum and then we're having lunch that is being provided by the chamber um, who offered to do this for us. And then from there, we're going to Brown versus the Board of Education. Right. Yeah. And we I couldn't fit Watkins them. in because they were already full, but we would have stopped by Watkins. We'll do it next school year. Um, so students also need to know. Thank you. Um, so uh, a question, other questions around? Do you go ahead, Ann. Um, yeah, so in relation to the behavior by subgroup charts, um, I think this one? to give better context, it would be good to know what percentage, because really you're looking at, like, for instance, males versus females. That's out of 100. So those shifts don't tell me anything other than it went back and forth between girls and boys. It's not telling me, okay, females are 30% of the population and they're only 20% of the incidents. Like, that would give me a reference. And then, or number of incidents to see if they're increasing or decreasing by subgroup, because really these proportions don't give me, I don't think give me any information to actually make a judgment on how these subgroups are doing, okay. because they're in relation to with, one another. I will work with Dr. Janet Craig here. She compiles the data um, and workforce, so we'll work with that, and to be able to make sure that you want percentages. Well, I think, I think if you're going to talk about percentage of instance I need to know what percentage the subgroup represents as a frame of reference so if they're over indexing so, so over there to the left hand side if you look at the females you're looking you're wanting out of the, um, uh, the, the elementary school what is the percentage of females for that 2138 yes I think that's important but I also think then also having a chart of number of incidences that those percentage are related to so that you can track because if overall incidents went down, boys still may have gone up while girls went down, but you may not see that in percentages. Mm -hmm. So it, it may be good for us to do a little bit of a session about data collection on some of this, because we may have a high number of incidents, but have a low number of student right. students who actually hit that. So I, I think we just need to talk about how you want the data shown and, and what yeah what that looks like, how you're wanting that reported. Yeah. We're still trying to make sure we're getting you the data that you need and, mm -hmm. and we can do that. So I, I actually think that's a great idea, Patrick, because I was also wondering about duplicated incidents or whatever, if it's one, one child that has a, you know, significant behavioral health issues, what might be contributing there. So I, I think a work session really for the last quarter mm -hmm. might be a good thing to do. And then you can educate us on those pieces, like what the data is. And then you will have an opportunity to say in the future, maybe for 2023, I mean, excuse me, I'm way behind, 24, it's late, 24, 25. We can talk about what that would look like for the subsequent year so that you all know when you're preparing these reports, like what is it that we're asking for and you're not getting the feedback too late for us to, yeah. you know, get. So um, does that sound like that would be helpful? I think that's or a great idea. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we'll and Kelly, let we'll me also say that this um, table that you're looking at right now uh -huh. was developed based upon a request from a board member mm -hmm. last school year. So we duplicate it, if you will. Is that, if I'm using that correct, um, um, Dr. Um, Jana Craig here, that um, you know, this, we duplicated this, the same table mm -hmm. 
Uh, so, so now we have an additional um, perspective that you want to um, bring, and that's and that's what. And I th actually, I think it know. would be great to hear a little bit more, like just like what do you do with the data? How do you mm -hmm. apply it to change? Mm -hmm. How do you make decisions with it? So, I really think it would be exactly. um, a great way for us to get educated as a group, also to hear about like how you make decisions here from building level. So, I think we can spend some time thinking about what that work session would be. We don't have to figure it out tonight, but that might help resolve some of the ongoing confusion that I'm recognizing as a pattern from that last year to this year. So we can do that. And I think it's important not only how we use the data from our district perspective, but, but how, how individual buildings yeah. use the data. And I think how the That's board uses important. it. When we look at the equity, equity policy, like are we using it the way that we say we're gonna use right. it? So we've asked for different types of, of data, but what is it exactly that we wanna make sure we're doing so that we can be partners in improving some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So. I, that would be great if, yeah. um, and we can look at it around a time that makes sense post when you have the end of year data. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and then, so you talked about the elementary restorative and behavioral matrix is being relooked at. Um, so our district implementation. implementation. Uh, oh, okay. so no, you're talking. I'm talking. I'm sorry. Let me go right here. Um, Yes, the development uh, of the so elementary restorative and behavior matrix. That was one of the things that, um, that we talked about at the Sunflower Site Council meeting oh, okay. is um, how different individuals are classifying the same incident differently. Mm -hmm. So maybe somebody has a teachable moment, somebody has, did an office referral for right. it. So um, I think that's great work. I think it's um, sorely needed. And, but I would say then that I think next year would become your baseline because you would have created that new template and hopefully then more people would be on the same page and then your only variance would be whether or not somebody actually did report it. But I think that's a great, great thing that you guys are working on, so I yeah. So, that. So next, so we're, we're putting that in, we're putting the document and things together now. We have uh, multiple examples that right. um, have been collected um, that incorporate our CI3T, not just any ba behavior matrix or restorative behavior matrix, um, but also in incorporate our CI3T. Um, and then from there, just, just like this, this, this year, we put our new um, secondary behavior matrix. This is our baseline data. Yeah, that's great. That, that we're utilizing. So we'll do the same thing with the elementary. Cool. Um, we, I'm recognizing the hour and we, we still have a bit more to go through. So I'm just, anything. It, I'm ready we, to move on. You're ready? Okay. I'm ready to move on. Okay. Move Thank on. you all very much. Uh, I look forward to the additional information coming up. And um, we are going to move before we end. We have someone that's here to, to uh, give us public comment. And Cynthia, I have to say, I cannot read your, last, your writing. So if you wouldn't mind, could, come on up and introduce yourself. We're glad you're here. Welcome. Thanks for your patience. Uh, this is a very late um, time in the evening. So really grateful that you you waited and, and hung out with us. I appreciate it. And if I read a little bit more slowly, I hope you guys have a little patience with me. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm Dr. Cindy Courtney, and I am here today primarily as a Lawrence community member, as well as a parent of one, but soon to be two Prairie Park students. I'm also a veterinarian and a conflict researcher. So first, I'd like to thank the district and particularly Dr. Cynthia Johnson for your ongoing commitment and investment in restorative practices. Um, of course, there's a lot of good news today in what Dr. Johnson and her team was able to share with you. Um, it's good not only to see the successes, but also an ongoing commitment to looking for those behavioral trends and the barriers to implementation going forward. I've also heard several of you allude to the importance of not just getting rid of conflict, but how does conflict happen, as well as the importance of involving families and the community. So that's all, all great to hear. But I'd also like to ask some questions. Um, in particular, while there is some data on the frequency of restorative practices being used, as you guys are thinking about what data you're asking for, uh, personally, I'm curious about what types of restorative practices are being used, what restorative approaches are being used. You guys have alluded to some of that. You know, Is that a teachable moment? Are we using some of those restorative questions? But also, are there being effective statements used, coached problem solving, restorative circles, behavioral agreements, a little bit more granular on how is our district actually using restorative practices and what restorative practices are being used. Um, that would be useful in a number of ways. I probably don't have time to address here, but would be happy to expand on further. Additionally, one of the benefits of restorative practices is to try to help address demographic disparities in discipline and in suspensions in particular. However, while 
some has been included in past reports. Demographic data here was provided only for the behavioral events, not for the suspensions or the use of restorative practices. Um, and while I appreciate that the underlying causes for behavior and suspensions are multifactorial and that a successful implementation is not determined by data alone, it would be helpful to know this kind of information as the district assesses which students are getting access to restorative practices and what the potential impact of not only restorative practices in general, but specific types of restorative practices in particular might be. As I mentioned, I'm excited to hear about more plans for developing family and community uh, uh, involvement. That was a great point, um, Mr. Breyers, about the difference between the two. I hadn't thought of that before, but it, it does feel different. That's true. Um, well, just a suggestion. Um, I've heard discussion about whether the character strong curriculum's values might be an opportunity for the community to engage at large with restorative practices and social emotional learning at large. I know it, in our family, we love the reports that come in and the activities that come with those character strong reports. It's been a great way for us to engage as a family, not just in teaching our, our students, but also in as adults being like, mm, maybe we need to think about taking responsibility for our actions and our family more generally. So again, just wanted to thank you all again for your time and ongoing commitment to restorative practices and inclusion. This stuff is important for every single student in our district. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Courtney. Uh, Dr. Courtney, did you write your questions down? Do you have them in electronic? Uh, yes, I can get those emailed to you all if you like. That would be helpful. Yeah. That might, they might lead some of our workshop questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so we are going to transition to uh, student our, our student transition attendance and behavior data. And uh, Patrick Kelly and Dr. Hare, or, Craig, or Dr. Craig Hare are here to provide that information, or maybe just Patrick. Good evening. My name is Patrick Kelly. I'm the Chief Academic Officer. I'm sorry that my PowerPoint went to sleep already. Um, I know it's late and I will try to move through this data quickly. Um, the purpose of this report is when we had the discussion about school closure last year, we heard there would be significant impacts on our students. And so we wanted to monitor those students and understand those impacts. Um, students were identified in our school, da our student data system. Um, so we could create a data set. And tonight we're gonna look at attendance and behavior data for those students and compare 2022-23 um, with 2023-24. Um, this data is inclusive only of the information that's in PowerSchool. I want to be very clear about that. Um, teachers and administrators have significant latitude um, on when to enter behavior or other data in our student management system. This report does not represent all of the behaviors that have occurred, only what is entered. There may be individual um, situations that are not represented in what's presented this evening. Our buildings um, ha may have had experienced larger numbers of students as students have come to their buildings, and this may uh, have made it more difficult to enter in some of this information. What you see here is the data set. Um, there are 402 students who attended Broken Arrow and Pinckney um, in 2022-23. 336 were elementary, 66 were middle school. This window is between August 1st and February 28th, and we, we mirrored that window um, this past year. What you see here is the attendance centers. I think I made a, a slight error on the 
every middle school and all but one elementary school had students from Broken Arrow and Pinckney attend. Um, there's some really tiny slivers on that chart that I don't think I quite picked up. So um, only one school didn't. Uh, the ones that aren't on that map are there are three at LVS and three uh, students also at Southwest Middle School. In that data set, 36 students left um, between those two schools, left those schools and were not in the following year. I, I, I do want to highlight before I jump into all the data, the work done by our Broken Arrow and Pinckney staff in supporting our students. Our, our students' success is really cumulative. Um, and we really owe a, a lot of gratitude to the work done by our Broken Arrow and Pinckney staff to prepare students for what happened after they attended Pinckney and, and Broken Arrow. Um, their student success is done um, because of the work done not only by those teachers, but those um, teachers who receive those students. So um, just as we dive into it, there's a, there's a way to look at this data that says one school was bad and one was good. That's not what this is. Um, this is just frequency and some data to look at here. So what you see here is our average daily attendance. We wanted to, initially when we did it, we just looked at the cohort group, but then we said, wow, there's some significant gains here. So we wanna see if we're making gains across the district. So at the top, you're gonna see all students in K-8, and you'll see that attendance has improved for all students, uh, for elementary students and for middle school students, K through eight between 2023 and 2024. Um, then we look at the cohort group and we see gains there as well. This just went away on that, now it's back. Th this is really a credit, I think, to the work that was done by our teachers and our administrators and our families at both Pinckney and Broken Arrow and their communication with students' new schools. We had PTAs that did logos for all their shirts. We really worked hard. Our, our elementary principals and middle school principals really communicating about how we can welcome these students in. We also have to express a ton of gratitude to our parents. We ask them to change transportation plans. We ask them to meet new protocols that are happening in a building, how it might have been done at Broken Arrow might not have been the same way it was done at Schwegler. We had to meet uh, new people. And, and so all of that is the great work done by our families, our students, and our staff and our buildings. We're gonna take a look at chronic absenteeism. You heard a little bit earlier, so I'm not gonna go into the definitions of each one of those, but this is our students K-8. You'll see that we are um, increasing no absence issues. That's the gold for 2023-24, and decreasing chronic absenteeism, trending and nearly are very close. I wanna highlight before I show the next slide to look at the scale. I know you know this, but these look very similar. That's 3,000, 2,000, 1,000. Remember our subset for the other was much smaller. So when we look at this, we see that our students who were attending Broken Arrow and Pinckney have made some similar gains. Um, for, we see a 44% increase in no attendance issues and a 28% decrease in chronic absenteeism. I also broke it down for you by um, K-4, so we could just look at elementary and then look at middle school separately. Um, I, we saw an 80, uh, this is 84% of our total students in that group, 44% increase in no absence and a 29% decrease in chronic absenteeism. Our, our fifth grade set is a very small set, and I, you'll see later, I'm gonna use some caution about reporting some of these numbers because we don't like to report student cohorts that are under 10 students because now we start to be able to identify those students. Um, but just caution you about that. This is 16% of the students in the data set. There's a 62% increase in no absence issues and a 23% decrease in chronic absenteeism. I'll stop there. That's all I'm going to talk about uh, on attendance. I thought it might be good to see if you had any questions so far. Okay, we'll continue on with behavior. Um, 
I um, met with our elementary principals this afternoon uh, to walk through this data to see, Dr. Lewis called it earlier, street data, right, or anecdotal data, to see how this matches. And I wanted to share some of their comments. They said the beginning of the year was rough. Um, it was hard. Um, we had some staffing decisions that maybe came a little late, um, but they really said that as students came in and they learned new behaviors and what the expectations were and created new relationships with teachers, that, that fall was tricky, but it's really been improving as we've gone into the spring. Um, we do have, um, you know, some, the principals reported there are some concern about how much is getting reported and it needs, I think, Kelly, you talked about that earlier, and we need to continue to work on that. Um, but, but I think there was an overall feeling that, um, that we're really making progress in behaviors. But we're also seeing progress in behaviors across the district. Green is your teachable moments, orange is your parent contact, and blue is your behavior entries. Um, you can see our teachable moments have been pretty consistent for K-8. Um, between last year and this year, we're reducing um, the number of behavior entries. Um, and it'd be interesting to do a little unpacking on why we're reducing parent contacts. That's just something to look at in the data. Here's our Broken Arrow and Pinckney students all together. Um, I put the numbers on these, you'll see 349 to 250, but to some of the um, discussion we had a little earlier about the number of incidents, I thought I'd share that as well. For our K-4 students, there were 70 students for those 349 instances. Um, and uh, well, let me go to the next slide to help with that. So this is our elementary students. K-4 had 70 students in 2022-23 who account for those 300. And in the next year, it was 33 students. So just trying to break out that data a, a little differently. Good in that our total numbers are going down um, and our, our number of uh, uh, behavior entries are reduced as well. For our fifth grade students, it sort of went the other direction. I don't know that this is, um, the good thing is look at those number of teachable moments, right? This is probably not uncommon for our fifth grade students going into sixth grade. If any of you have met a middle schooler, I taught middle school for a long time. Remember, they also went from one teacher, maybe two, to seven teachers a day. So that's a lot more um, expectations to learn um, as, they, as they go through those years. So um, just sharing that data about them a little bit. And then we're gonna look at ISS and OSS. Um, you'll see that um, in that same time period, we saw a decrease um, in both the number of OSS and the number of ISS and the total number as well. And then um, we also saw that in, uh, in our, in our um, group of uh, Broken Arrow and Pinckney students in that cohort. I thought I'd just let you know the total number of students in each group. So when you look at the orange box um, for 2022-23 for these students, that calculates a total of 58 students. And then over in the right-hand box, that's 21 students. So incidents are different than the total number of students involved in that. And maybe this is a way as we think about how to share data in the future to sort of see that, right? Um, so you can see those bars for our K-4 students um, from 2022-23 and then in 2023-24. And you'll notice in that blue bar on the 23-24, that's less than 10 students um, in that group of first through fifth graders this year. And finally, our middle school students, both of these groups, so these are 20, both of these groups are less than 10 students. Um, so um, we're seeing maybe a, a few students have a high number of these OSS and ISS um, uh, experiences that we're, that we're working on. And when you visit with principals, they, they know who those students are and, and what those challenges are. Um, we wanna make sure that every report we talk about equity, I wanted to be real careful, and we didn't, we're not doing graphs on this one because this is a subgroup of a subgroup, right? So we're getting really tiny here. Um, but here are some things we saw. 
Um, we saw increases in average daily attendance for all subgroups except Asian and Native American. Decreases in chronic absenteeism, the largest decrease was multiracial and the smallest decrease was black. And increases in no attendance issue for subgroups and you see the largest increase and the smallest increase there. And then for behavior, here's some of the equity data to look at. I'm at decrease for all groups except Native American and there was no change. And I will tell you that is a very small subgroup um, in this data set. Um, parent contact increased significantly for all subgroups except black. Um, teachable moments increased for Native Americans and multiracial. ISS and OSS, and there you start to see how small some of these groups are. We're looking at zero to one or three to four. And then the US of ISS decreased for 55% of our Hispanic students. So I tried to get the, that and make sure you, if you have any comments, because I know it's quite late and I appreciate your attention to that report. Do you have any questions? I don't know, you did really well for 10, 12. Thank you so much. Um, we had questions last night about when they would see academic data and similar to my question to Dr. Johnson, that will be after the end of the year. Yeah, we, we could certainly do that. We, we did take, we have some new at-risk indicators and I will tell you, we just did that. We were, we're trying to put behavior and attendance with the equity, or we're trying to put them a little bit side by side, a little theme action going there. Um, but I did look at the at-risk and a little, they're about the same. The at-risk numbers were the same last year as they are this year. We had some kids who are no longer at our at-risk and some who've been added, um, but it's about the same. We'll get you more detailed um, data once we finish state assessments and we can look at that. We feel much more confident in that data. Okay, questions? I just have, I just have two things real quick. So one, um, you know, anytime you pull data, you know, it's, you can slice data a lot of ways. And so I, I wanna thank you for taking the time to try and put it in as much context as you possibly can, right? I mean, um, just trying to, to pull data out of power school and present it as, as this is the way it is, is not as transparent as we'd like it to be. So I like that that, that you put as much context in, in there as you went. So I really appreciate that. So uh, I just, I, I'm, I'm just curious. I just have one question. When you were going through at the very beginning, when you were talking about all the different schools and and you mentioned that it was it was all but one elementary school and you mentioned that you met with principals today did you meet with every elementary school principal today no thank you for asking me about that gr i met with those schools that were hot so the schools that received a large number of students not all principals okay and i met with those principals who were at pinckney and uh, broken air they happen to still be in our district and i met with them as well and i appreciate them sharing some of the feelings of staff at broken arrow and pinckney last year um, i think to your point a little bit seeing that data without it being in context I, it's sometimes hard to share when we post that to share the whole story behind that data on the slides that are posted. And so I think it was really helpful for me as an administrator to hear from those principals how their former staff reacted to that. And I, I just really want to take a moment again and thank them for their hard work. Those, there was a ton of work done last year for those kids that were really seeing the impacts of whether that's behavior plans, um, it's mainly behavior plans, but um, those are schools who did amazing work last year and we've had so much success because there was such great communication about that student's behavior plan when they got to their new school. So I don't know if that's where you were going, but I took it there anyways, because I just want to thank those teachers again. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you. Done. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so uh, I am going to um, make a motion that it's a bit amended to 15 minutes to see if we can move to this executive session, uh, move through it a little bit quicker. Is that okay with you? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I move to recess uh, to executive session for the purpose of discussing personnel matters of non-elected personnel in order to protect the privacy interests of individuals to be discussed with Dr. Anthony Lewis invited to be present and with the board to return to open session in this room at 1030 with no action to follow. Second. Jones? Yes. Byers? Yes. Kimball? Yes. Kadu Blackwood? Yes. Costello? 
Yes. Franklin? Yes. Gordon Ross? Yes. Motion passes 7-0.
executive session and we need to extend for 10 minutes. So I move that the board move to executive session until 1040 with Anthony Lewis to be invited. Second. Kelly, can I, read, can I read the motion, please? Oh, Shannon, I knew you were going to be like <laughs> okay. Kelly. Yeah. And then, 41. I okay, move the recess to executive session for the purposes of discussing um, oh, yeah. personnel matters of non-elected personnel in order to protect the privacy interests of the individuals to be discussed with Dr. Anthony Lewis invited to be present and with the board to return to open session in this room at uh, 1041 yes. with no action to follow. Second. Yes. Byers? Yes. Kibble? Could do Blackwood. Yes. Costello. Yes. Franklin. Yes. Gordon Ross. Yes. Motion passed.
I, I move to adjourn the meeting. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed?